Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to today's event. Um, in particular, I'd like to welcome um, you, our audience, um, our panelists, and of course, our brilliant behind the scenes colleagues from the Courtaulds Research Forum who are going to be looking after us today. We are thrilled to welcome you to today's event, J. DeFeo, a symposium, which is an event co-organized by myself, uh, Professor Joe Applin, and from Dr. Pierre Gottscheller, who's joined me on screen here. And we've organized this with the generous support of the J. DeFeo Foundation and the Center for American Art here at the Courtauld. We have a really distinguished lineup of speakers today presenting new research into DeFeo's work. Long known for the magisterial work, The Rose, which she worked on between 1958 and 66, a work that began life as an oil painting on canvas that grew in intensity, density, material and size. Today's event offers an equally expanded casting of DeFeo's practice. Papers shed new light on aspects of DeFeo's career, as well as shifting how we can think about some of the artist's better known works. It's been a long while in the planning and we are extraordinarily grateful to all of our panelists for sticking with us from pre to now post, maybe post uh, COVID times. We're sorry that we aren't in person, but we're also thrilled to welcome such a large audience and to be together for this. We've been thinking about this for a long time, in particular with um, Leah Levy, director of the J. DeFeo Foundation, who's been our tireless, generous supporter and interlocutor during this long period of discussion about what this event might be. So just to briefly explain the outline of the event, we're going to start with three 20 minute papers that will be followed by about 20 minutes of discussion, where we're going to welcome questions from the audience as well, and you can use the chat, uh, the chat function to submit those. Then just after a brief break, we'll return for a further three papers and another period of discussion. And we'll be ending at half past seven GMT um, with a few closing remarks from Leah Levy, who is joining us today. So I'm gonna introduce the first of our speakers, who is Lucy Bradnock, who's Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Nottingham. She's author of No More Masterpieces, Modern Art After Artaud, which was published recently by Yale University Press. And Lucy's paper today is titled J. DeFeo's Bodies, Painting as a Muscular Principle. So over to you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Joe and Pia. It's really um, wonderful to be with you virtually. Um, and thank you for persevering um, with uh, this symposium. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am a little croaky this evening, um, so I will, I'll do my best. Um, so my paper is called um, J. DeFeo's Bodies, Painting as a Muscular Principle. It's a little on the speculative side, and it relates also to um, some of the discussions that I unpack uh, more extensively in my book. In 1975, fledgling curator and critic Meryl Green included six works on paper by J. DeFeo in the exhibition Art as a Muscular Principle, including those um, we can see on screen held at the John and Nora Warbaker Gallery at Mount Holyoke College, South Hadley, Massachusetts. Subtitled 10 Artists and San Francisco 1950 to 1965, Roots and New Directions, the exhibition included DeFeo's work alongside that of Wallace Berman, Joan Brown, Bruce Connor, George Herms, Jess, Robert Levine, Fred Martin, Arthur Munro, and Keith Sansenbach. Despite those chronological parameters, 1950 to 1965, the choice of DeFeo's works in fact ranged slightly broader, including two produced during the 1970s, those two on the right hand side of our screen after image from 1970, and Tuxedo Junction made in 1974 and comprised of fragments of an earlier work, the Estacada from 1965. In some senses, though her most famous works were absent from the exhibition, the selection represents a sort of retrospective, homing in on moments in her career often considered pivotal or reflective, thus standing in, in a sense, for her larger body of work. 
In my paper this afternoon, I want briefly to dwell on Green's premise in this exhibition to take seriously the question of what it means to understand De Feo's art as a muscular principle, how this notion might relate to interpretations that have read it in terms of cavernous or palimpsestic sites, and what insight it might give us into what was at stake for abstract painting in mid-century San Francisco. In organizing her exhibition, Green declared that her approach was simultaneously philosophical, psychological, mystical, phenomenological, political, social, and speculative. Her substantial catalog essay, excerpted from an unpublished manuscript penned the previous year, situates the work of DeFeo and her peers in relation to the epic sweep of American history and ideology, in which the logic of the settlers was pitted against the land in order to tame it. And it's worth acknowledging, of course, the, the cultural undertones of that particular frontier narrative. Lucy, I think every time you move your paper, we get quite a rustle. I don't know where the microphone is on your computer, but sorry. I'll, I'll be more quiet. <laughs> um, the Puritan work ethic and ideology of individualism, green sets against the pluralistic, experiential and collective logic that she identifies in the works included in her exhibition and in the community of artists that produced them. A logic that gives primacy not only to community, but also to physical proximity and touch. The American people, she writes, were assembled much like an epic poem. So many words, phrases, sounds that found cadence and meaning only when touching, when juxtaposed as if by poetics. Green thus sketched out the particularities of the San Francisco scene, insular, interdisciplinary and self-referential, in a manner that's been picked up by art historians subsequently working on DeFeo and her peers. And I'm thinking here, for example, of scholars like Michael Duncan, who's described the work of DeFeo and those other artists as explicitly interrelational and networked. Green framed insularity in terms of the creative potential that it offered, writing that, quote, those unwilling to alter their creative direction upon the command of the art buying public consciously developed a style of living and working that revolved about their own self images as artists. The photograph of Jay DeFeo that was chosen for the invitation to Green's exhibition and for the cover of its slender catalogue, both of those on screen now, is explicitly set up as representing this form of self imaging at work, illustrating from the outset some of the implications of Green's curatorial premise, as well as acknowledging, of course, the work conspicuously missing from the gallery showing of DeFeo's work. Taken by Wallace Berman during a photo shoot in 1958, the image shows a naked DeFeo as a sort of Vitruvian woman, arms and legs outstretched in alignment with the radiating ridges of the painting behind her, at that point titled Death Rose, but later known as The Rose. And I think many of us will be familiar with this image, which has become quite iconic in the literature on DeFeo and quite crucial to the framing of her work during this period. In her essay on Berman's portraits of DeFeo, Elizabeth Farrell has read this set of images as enacting an oscillation between radiating creative genius and light dappled artists model, the kind of subject object dialectic that would come to preoccupy other women artists. And I'm thinking here of Carolee Schneeman's eye body photographs in particular. For Ferrell, Berman's images of DeFeo embody the generative potential of the female body, staged via visceral sexuality and creative agency. What I want to suggest is that reading DeFeo's work through the lens of the muscular principle, we might understand painting as being about the power of bodies more generally and in the abstract rather than the particular, in line with a broader corporeal discourse that was circulating among the West Coast counterculture at mid-century and particularly among those Fillmore district artists and poets whom DeFeo counted as her circle. The notion of art as a muscular principle was not one applied entirely retrospectively by Green. She borrowed the phrase with encouragement from the San Francisco artist Robert Emery Johnson, 
from the poet Michael McClure, a crucial figure in the San Francisco milieu that constituted the exhibition. And though McClure was not included in Green's roster by virtue of being a poet primarily rather than an artist, many of his friends were. An excerpt of his poem, Rare Angel, was printed in the exhibition catalogue, including a line that makes reference to a muscular sensation. A single sheet broadside published by McClure in 1964 includes as its opening gambit the line, and you might be able to just about read it on screen, um, poetry is a muscular principle. Beneath a set of photographs of the poet with Leonine Mame created by Robert Levine, um, the photos shot again by Wallace Berman. And images from that shoot also appear on the cover of Ghost Tantras, um, McClure's um, book of poems, and also on the cassette case of the recording of McClure reading those poems to the lions at San Francisco Zoo. McClure's aim was to liberate poetry from the constraints of lyricism and metaphor in order to elicit a visceral response in his listeners. His text outlines the physical power of poetry as, and I'm quoting from it here, a muscular principle and a revolution for the body, spirit and intellect and ear that does not mimic but joins and exhorts reality. There's a kind of paradox in McClure's text which frames a turn or return to the body as a practice embedded in external reality rather than a retreat. This tension between introspection and engagement, the inner life of the body versus its external place in the world is, I would argue, at the heart of De Feo's practice also. And my argument here is that the model of the muscular principle offers a way not of reconciling that apparent ambivalence, but of placing it front and center. And I'm also keen to think about how this notion might help us to escape the simplistic framing of De Feo as a, a reclusive and obsessive visionary. As Green implies, McClure's insistence on art as a somatic endeavor, a notion picked up by Green to apply to those visual artists with whom the poet was associated, binds together what might seem disparate material practices of assemblage, painting, and poetry, each implicated in a different set of histories and discourses, but here each oriented toward the body as a site of practice. Crucially, it's distinct from the kind of body that inhabits Harold Rosenberg's model of action painting, according to which, as we know, the painting is conceived as a spatial stage for the body of the artist, an arena in which to act. In contrast to that notion of the body as a creative actor in the world, but ultimately separate from it and having mastery over it, the muscular principle posits the body as embedded in the world. Body, painting and world exist in one and the same sphere, so that the distinctions between interior and exterior dissolve. The notion of poetry or art or painting as a muscular principle emphasizes the material stuff of the body. It surfaces masses, textures, pulses, and synaptic connections as intimately connected to both the material mass of painting and to the body of the artist as she paints. The muscular principle thus located creative practice in the body's most elemental parts. It proposed the idea of physical rather than cerebral instinct and permits an understanding of painting in relation to the notion of muscle memory, where the act and actions of painting are committed or ingrained into the matter of, matter of the body via repetition. In the context of the rose, this notion seems particularly apt, given the sustained intensity with which De Feo labored on the painting, and what registered certainly in Connor's film of the occasion as her feeling of bereftness upon its removal from her Fillmore Street studio in November of 1965. Connor's descriptions of the work in De Feo's studio, the flesh-like paint on both canvas and floor, his sense that the space seemed almost alive, conjure the studio as the cavernous interior of the body and focus on the work's potential as an organic being. Connor routinely described his own constructions in similarly corporeal terms, 
albeit those works were more obviously visceral in form and appearance and often utilized found materials that bore the trace of bodily contact, most notably um, nylon stockings. Describing the process of creating his work Rat Bastard from 1958, for example, Connor likened the action of slashing the object to cutting through skin and the resultant stuffed object looking like its innards were coming out. And it's tempting to read the growth and change of DeFeo's monumental painting, The Rose, as in some ways mimicking an organism, breathing, growing, extending, and consuming those beads, wire, pearls that were added to and then subsumed into the paint layers as the painting appeared to kind of grow outwards. Connor also used bodily metaphors to align the work with the artist's own flesh, later describing the rose as, and I'm quoting him here, tongue-tipped furnace pollen of J. DeFeo's muscle tone. In his later account of the painting's removal, and I'm citing an interview with Connor um, from 1995, he emphasizes the bodily union that DeFeo had with the painting even as her work on it was forced to cease. I turned around, he says, and there she was lying on the wrapped up canvas itself as though it were a big double bed. And so it seemed symbolically as if she were packaged into it herself. In his poem on White Rose, he confesses, I can't separate Jay from her painting, a sentiment that echoed DeFeo's own assertion that she wanted to live in them. Bodies of people and of works often inhabit a fraught position in DeFeo's oeuvre and her archive, subject to repetition, fragmentation, and tearing, folding, binding. I'm slightly including this slide as an excuse to show um, the kind of wonderful torn objects in uh, DeFeo's archive, including on the right, her response to Wallace Berman's um, loose leaf journal seminar, which she kind of tore and bound um, with tape. In the years leading up to the Art as a Muscular Principle exhibition, DeFeo had created a number of works that incorporated parts or images of earlier works. Here, the photo collage of a detail of the eyes on the left-hand side and sections of the destroyed Estacada incorporated into Tuxedo Junction on the right, one that was actually included in Green's exhibition. The Estacada had been painted directly onto paper stapled to the wall and was torn when removed during DeFeo's departure from her Fillmore Street studio. DeFeo created the new work for an exhibition in 1974 and it was included in Green's Muscular Principle show the following year. Such instances are typical of DeFeo's iterative practice, which had played out as the unrelenting reworking of the rose, but here takes on a more explicitly cross-temporal and self-referential tone. I'd argue that the muscular principle that McClure and Green propose, the notion of iterative movements that originate in the body, also offers a useful framework for understanding this act of revisiting, revising and reworking. This is not to say that the muscular principle is merely about reading works as somatic surrogates, their surfaces correlating aesthetically with te the textures and skeins of the human body. Muscle memory suggests a temporal sense of the body implicated in creative practice, a notion that's picked up explicitly in Green's catalogue essay in relation to painting in DeFeo's case, but Green applies the term too to the assemblage works of Connor, George Herms and Wally Hedrick and the collage work of Jess and Wallace Berman. The creative state that Green outlines is rooted in the body as a site of conviction and judgment. And I'm quoting from Green here who writes, it is the tracking of the memory the movement of the body and the patterns of the soul. It is the psychic impression of subjective experience. So according to that notion, the body is at once the individual body of the artist and the collective body of their community with its own rituals and rites of initiation and passage. This bodily orientation is crucial to Green's interpretation of a range of creative practices that she frames as an attempt, and again, I'm quoting from, from her, to experience life as a biological phenomenon rather than as a mechanical one. Green's emphasis in the art as a muscular principle catalogue therefore implies more than the visceral nature of DeFeo's 
painted surfaces or the bodily scale of her larger works. Rather in line with other practices in the 1950s, it locates engagement and action in the material of the body. Understood in this way, the mass and weight that critics often identified in J. DeFeo's works from the small scale early works of the Florence series to the monumental Veronica and Rose paintings might be understood not only in relation to architectural or, or geological formations and, and Catherine Spencer has argued really beautifully and persuasively for the latter, but also to the body itself. Green articulates this as a, a shift away from the external referent and inwards towards the body's energies, surfaces and mass. But I want to argue that there is a kind of um, real world politics to that, that we shouldn't read this turn towards the body as uh, a kind of retreat into um, one's own self. The sense of ambivalence a turn inwards to the body and outwards to the world runs through McClure's writing and Green's exhibition catalogue essay alike. Um, Green's essay is filled with these tensions and contradictions. Um, it's quite a strange essay in many ways. She talks about constructive anarchy, collective individualism, carefree existentialism, my favourite of all of those phrases, all of which kind of contradictions and tensions she frames as a genuine American paradox, and that's her phrasing there. This conjugation of opposites, Green explicitly locates in DeFeo's work, which is at once monumental and introspective, philosophical and intuitive, and she locates those contradictions in the physical matter of the body, which play out as experiences of the world. So she writes, and I'm quoting from her here, the gesture which had lost its subject and in painting at least had become purer and purer until it reached the dead end of nothingness became personal missionary action that propelled the ego in all directions at once and led the individual to embrace the contradictions of life, the diseases and the cures. This sense of duality presents the muscular principle as deeply political. In the context of a period characterized by a national security discourse that sought to categorize and conscribe and contain bodies, in particular those deemed other on grounds of race, gender, sexuality, or perceived delinquency, an insistence on art as a muscular principle might be framed as an act of resistance, and we might remember um, McClure's use of that word revolutionary, rather than as apolitical introspection. McClure is clear that the muscular principle is a revolutionary political commitment, as well as an existential proposition. Shortly after the exhibition at Mount Holyoke opened in the spring of 1975, DeFeo sent the artist Robert Emery Johnson an altered collaged version of the exhibition invitation. In place of the transcendental image of DeFeo in front of the rose, she pasted another more down to earth picture, a photograph of herself mopping the kitchen floor in her Larkspur home, wearing nothing but high heels, a paradigmatic vision of offbeat countercultural domesticity. According to its recipient, Jay sent this to me, the new photo, and said, this is the real art as a muscular principle. On the one hand, the image undercuts the existential solemnity of McClure's concept, making literal and banal the notions of art as muscle memory based on repeated physical labor in the same sense as mopping the floors occupies that category. And in doing so, I think, um, and, and I'm kind of coming to a close in arguing this, I think that DeFeo makes an important point about the gendering of abstract painting versus housework, marking out the particularity of McClure's more abstract notion of the body. It also suggests that by 1975, against a backdrop of second wave feminism, DeFeo might have been rethinking the transcendental vision embodied in Berman's original photograph, one that she'd been keen to include in the 1959 exhibition, 16 Americans. DeFeo's tongue in cheek intervention gets at the heart then of the muscular principle as a bodily practice 
that is, after all, deeply contextual and social, rooted in everydayness rather than exceptionalism, community rather than individualism, smallness as much as monumentality, and housework as much as painting. Thank you. Lucy, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Really, really wonderful. I'm so uh, grateful to you for kicking things off. Thank you. Um, I'm going to press straight on and we'll come back for questions too. Um, by introducing um, Catherine Spencer next. Um, Catherine is a lecturer in the School of Art History at the University of St Andrews. She's the author of Beyond the Happening, Performance Art and the Politics of Communication with Manchester University Press in 2020, and has published numerous uh, brilliant essays in Art History, Art Journal, British Art Studies, Oxford Art Journal, Parallax, and Tate Papers. And the title of Catherine's paper today is Abstraction in Pieces. Catherine, if you'd like to share your screen and I will hand over to you. Okay, great, thanks so much, Jo. Um, and Thank you um, to you, Joe, and to Pia um, for organizing such a great day. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I would also like to thank Leah Levy, Dawn Troy, and Michael Carr for um, their quite significant help um, over the years with my research into DeFeo. And I'm also really excited to be following um, from Lucy's um, fantastic paper. Um, I think there's some really interesting overlaps that, that we can bring out in the discussion. Excuse me, I'm not sharing my screen properly. Okay. So for periods during the 1970s, Jay DeFeo became, as she put it, totally absorbed in photography. While teaching at the San Francisco Art Institute, photographers introduced her to the darkroom and taught her how to use the equipment and chemicals, with the result that photography uh, became a very important part, those are DeFeo's words, of her expression. In 1973, a National Endowment for the Arts grant enabled DeFeo to buy a much treasured medium format Hasselblad camera and to create a darkroom in her house in Larkspur, providing the facility to print in an intimate way that increasingly integrated with her drawings and paintings. DeFeo made many prints during this decade and exhibited some of them in 1975 but she also created multiple contact sheets of her negatives, subsequently binding them into books that tracked her working pro progress. And the results, which I'm showing here, uh, a very few of these on the slides, constitute both the key to her work and a component of her practice, I think, in its own right. In her 1975 journal, Jay DeFeo Jay described how, when leafed through rapidly, these books reveal a shifting dreamlike kaleidoscope of forms that appear and disappear. The contact sheets are clearly self-historicizations through which DeFeo attempts to make sense of her own visual vocabulary and her place in histories of art. But the format of the contact sheets also constitutes a suggestive matrix of ideas, inspirations and compulsions that fill the interstices of the modernist grid with the mess of the body, the clutter of a studio that is also a living space, and with the elisions, fabrications, condensations, and workings over of memory. With the contact sheets, DeFeo was providing future viewers, historians, and curators with a visual lexicon for her working process. But they also alert us to the ways in which abstraction and the body constantly interrelate in her work particularly in relation to the dynamics of salvage and loss, vulnerability, mortality, and care. Now, the ideas captured in the contact sheets are often extremely compelling as DeFeo plays with her own work and constantly reformulates it. But the one I'm currently showing on the slide from 1972 particularly caught my eye. The central actor in this uh, contact sheet is a painting using synthetic polymer that DeFeo was working on at the time in, entitled Crescent Bridge 1, and which also exists in a second version as Crescent Bridge 2. This painting is the sun in a rotating solar system of reproductions of works by other artists and of DeFeo's own work, as well as some of the talismanic relic-like objects which became jumping off points for drawings and paintings of the 1970s and 1980s. So if you look 
very closely in this frame here, we have a reproduction of De Feo's monumental painting, The Rose, um, which she had been working on almost exclusively, but not quite during the 1960s. And in the final frame here, we see the prosthetic dental bridge made from a combination of false teeth and De Feo's own extracted teeth, which the artist wore for many years um, due to the periodontitis periodontitis that she suffered, um, possibly caused by poisoning from leaded paint. This necessitated the removal of many teeth over the years, an excruciating process that often left her mouth feeling extremely tender. This uncanny object was the template for Crescent, the two Crescent Bridge paintings. And so the contact sheet in this respect traces De Feo's crucial interest in what she described to the curator Dorothy C. Miller as, quote, the personal connection or impetus that gives an abstract principle its special reality. The context sheet, moreover, cues us into the way in which this connection between lived experience and abstract principle operates in DeFeo's work, showing how it is predicated on bodily invasion and abstraction a rupture of securely bonded divisions between interior and exterior. One of the art historical images that DeFeo has included in one of her carefully arranged tableaus is Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp from 1632. In this painting, Tulp conducts an anatomy lesson using a pair of metal forceps to demonstrate the movement of muscles and tendons in the left arm of a corpse while replicating the movement with his own free hand, juxtaposing exterior impression with interior workings. Yet for all the apparent scrutiny afforded by the medical gaze, a gaping wound opens between the tendons, which signals the presence of unknown depths. Years later, De Feo would record a dream of undergoing an autopsy in which body and paint merge with visceral power. And I'm quoting from her journal here. My dreams are all too graphic. The other night I was stretched over a table, head foregrounded, my body opened, pins and wires stretched and pulled to the edge of canvas. I was outside the painting myself, starting with the right arm, making it more muscular. While Rembrandt's painting takes the anatomy lesson as its subject, De Feo arguably adopted it as a working process one which was alive to the pain and damage caused by treating the body as an object or an abstraction, and simultaneously invested in how paint and canvas might enable an aesthetics of suturing, tending, and care. And underscoring this, another of the images that De Feo is playing with here um, is a reproduction of a patient undergoing an operation which focuses on the hands of the surgeons as they cut and as they heal. Now, this is perhaps an overly personal reading, but I find myself deeply moved on returning to De Feo's work of the 1970s from within a pandemic to see just how strongly and generously it speaks to sickness, tiredness, weariness, aging, to a body in pain, a body in pieces, in need of help and assistance, from a perspective that is concerned with repair and consolation rather than pathologization and isolation. In this, I'm following a line of thought articulated by the curator Dana Miller, who reflecting on DeFeo's links with surrealism, insightfully notes how she, quote, gravitated towards subjects that conveyed vulnerability of the body and her antennae were highly attuned to objects bearing wounds or signs of age. The piece of writing which most fully explores these aspects of De Feo's work, to my mind, is a 2014 essay by the artist Walid Beshti, Beshti describes the 1970s as De Feo moved away from the demands of the Rose in a way that movingly encapsulates the relationships charted by her contact sheets. And I quote, small objects would now receive her devotions, offering her a less demanding muse and giving her work a quickness. I love Beshti's use of that word, quickness suggesting life as well as fluidity. It had not had for over a decade. To start out, she began with her body and its increasingly fragile boundaries. And in this, another story is told. One of her bodies subjected to the conditions of being an artist, its stresses, its toxins, its financial distress, 
and the foraging around necessary to simply keep working. I want to stress that I, and neither Beshti nor Miller, I think, are seeking to reduce De Feo to her body or to her biography, problems which beset the critical response to her work and to that of many women artists working with abstraction in the post-war period. Rather, I think our current circumstances ask us to turn that kind of assumption on its head. They illuminate how De Feo's knowledge and understanding of the pain caused by her teeth and by her later diagnosis with the lung cancer which would cause her death in 1989 provided the personal experience which enabled her to make such powerful statements about the large and complex topics of sickness and health, incorporating the intimacies of the body and its wider social infrastructures, what we might call the collective singularity of embodiment, together with the architectures of ableism, which create constructs such as broken and defective, and which condition how care is rationed unevenly and unfairly. In Woman, the New York School and other true abstractions, the writer Maggie Nelson notes that women artists have worked hard at, quote, mocking, reclaiming, transforming, eroticizing, politicizing, deforming, and expanding the traditions of abstract painting. Even as the book from which uh, this quote is taken treats the concept of woman as a true abstraction. These concepts, Nelson stresses, are at once, quote, expansive and alive. Yet while their de definitions necessarily remain in flex, they are not without real reference or pragmatic power. Nelson's perspective coheres with David Getze's use of transgender studies in his 2015 book, Abstract Bodies, to explore how sculpture in 1960s America continued to evoke the bodily, but did so in abstracted ways, which refused a constricted binary notion of gender and instead opened up onto an expanded field of gender. These provide crucial coordinates for thinking about how De Feo's work destabilizes bodily certainties through abstraction, particularly regarding normative ideas about bodily coherence, as I seek to trace here. De Feo's movement into photography occurred in conjunction with a return to painting between 1970 and 1971, after the long, and I think it is right and not pathologizing to say traumatic, experience of working on the Rose in San Francisco and then in LA, where it was displayed at the Pasadena Art Museum in 1969. The end of the Rose as a project was personal as well as artistic, marking her divorce from the artist Wally Hedrick and move away from San Francisco and its tight-knit social and creative world of the 1950s and early 1960s. Some of these new works were painted on the back of posters testifying to De Feo's material straits at this time. These are fascinating excursions which have been seen following De Feo's own interpretation as fragmenting and reconfiguring the imagery that she had been attempting to fuse into one painting with the rose. But they also clearly state a new set of concerns, bodily wounding, orifices, apertures and portals, sites of transition between inner and outer, and with seeking to disrupt normative definitions of value and wholeness. Unknown image of 1971 deploys a motif inspired by the broken handle of a coffee cup, which De Feo kept um, for decades and which would later develop into several large scale paintings. It is not simply that the broken handle is in this painting repaired and extended through this kind of double loop, but that the painting asks us to consider what we might mean by terms such as broken or useless. Untitled of 19th expressions of these questions with particular force. A small tooth in acrylic and graphite crosses the field of vision like a small comet or shooting star, while remaining nonetheless very clearly an extracted molar, trailing connotations of decay and pain. Other images from this moment return to the imagery of the eye that would remain constant throughout De Feo's career and which relates to a large drawing completed in 1958, one eyeball of which would be disfigured later by a member of the public when it was exhibited um, in the late 1970s. Untitled on the left, uh, although that was an idea that I think De Feo had herself been playing with, as you can see in this collage um, on, the, on the right. And then in Untitled of 1970, um, we, we have the eye shape surrounded by a halo of bruised colours, 
while the center of the eye and the pupil itself is marbled and blinded. A lost tooth, a visionless clouded eye. These are the fragments of the body that DeFeo abstracts and in so doing, asks us to question our preconceptions about wholeness, disability and coherence. Even in Mertz's Eye of 1971, perhaps one of the more representational or anchored of these works, which is based uh, on a study of one of DeFeo's dogs, there is a deeply haunting quality present. And I find it difficult not to read this work in relation to DeFeo's later account in her journal of the death of, a mother, of another much-loved dog called R. Mutt. Um, and this is DeFeo. Her loss reduces me to complete grief now and then, her eyes, but also the incident is prophetic of losses yet to come, of certain loneliness. The Bay Area art critic, Tom Albright, a longstanding champion of DeFeo's work, grasped the significant implications of these pieces when they were displayed in a group exhibition at the Oakland Museum in 1971. Albright welcomed this chance to see DeFeo's work in public for the first time in several years, writing of works like After Image, which is perhaps the best known piece of this period. These are sometimes abstract windows, organic blots or daubs of color, sometimes strange ambiguous images that work on several levels, abalone shells that double as black gaping eyes, flanged nut-like shapes that suggest sea creatures or erotic orifices. The forms are transfixed on sheets of paper that have been crumpled and torn and provided with yellowish film to create a sense of age, funk and decay. Albright captures the blurring of human and animal, the interest in points of transition and the emphasis on decay, but also on repair that characterizes these works, but nonetheless stops short of the considerations of health and care that they might also be seen to manifest and their insistence on the potential interconnection as much as the atomization of distinct parts. The regenerative aspects of these works correlates with what the French art historian Henri Faucillon called the life of forms, constantly changing and interconnected entities rather than static singularities. By way of what is, I would like to stress, quite a speculative conclusion. I would like to stay with this ethic of interconnection in DeFeo's work and its concomitant combination of vulnerability and strength as it relates to other artists who have explored the politics of care. In this, I follow a 2018 exhibition curated by Sung Duk Kim and Frank Gathero at Lee Consortium in France entitled The Ripple Effect, which captured how many artists have found material and conceptual support in DeFeo's practice. The connections I want to trace briefly here are not as conscious, but I hope provide productive ways of thinking about DeFeo's abstraction of the body and her challenge to bodily abstractions. To return briefly to Rembrandt, while the attention of the students here is on the medical demonstration, Rembrandt does not let the viewer forget that there is what, once, there is what was once a person at the heart of this painting. DeFeo's abstractions work in similar ways, albeit through very different processes. Her use of everyday items like bits of scotch tape, eraser shavings, cups and shoehorns to articulate this, puts me in mind of Jesse Darling's deconstructions of everyday objects to consider states of vulnerability, but also to question what gets defined as different or other. As Darling has said of their work, quote, I think the consistent thread is that everything is vulnerable. The connection engenders violence as well as support. The interconnectedness of things is full of trouble, but it's what there is. Nobody gets out of here alive and nothing is too big to fail. Closer to home in San Francisco for DeFeo, I think of photographs of Ruth Asawa looping links of wire for her intricate organic sculptures, some of which show the bits of tape that she used to protect her hands from the wire, from cuts and from scarring. Reading Marilyn Chase's description of Asawa's um, fights with lupus in later life sparks further connections. Quote, as flashes of pain struck her legs five minutes apart through one night, she envisioned her ravaged nerves as the network of wires of her sculpture. Again, this is not to suggest that these works should be read as manifesting or in Asawa's case, somehow anticipating the purely personal, but that DeFeo, Asawa and Darling's abstractions include rather than exclude bodily specificity. <laughs> <laughs> 
Here is DeFeo in 1978, excitedly starting a series from drawings based on nothing more than, quote, the broken scotch tape that's been nailed to the wall for a year or so. Here is DeFeo in 1984, sending the fragmentary remains of her painting White Speaker to be placed at Tom Albright's bedside so that it could watch over her friend as he died at the shockingly young age of 48 from cancer. Here she is photographing the cast that was placed on her dog, Armut, after she was hit by a car. And here is DeFeo in a 1977 journal entry, wondering where to go next. Quote, difficult to decide which areas should move forward to a more tangible reality and which should move in the area of abstraction. This was the predicament of the body as DeFeo saw it, and her sympathy and understanding of this condition shines through her work and that of other artists attuned to the material friability of the body in the world while celebrating its endurance and its joys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Another really rich paper, some really tremendous images there. I think we've got lots to talk about later. So I'm going to, um, in order to make time for that, move straight on to um, our next paper. Um, this is a co-written paper, and I'm going to introduce uh, both authors now. Um, Pia Gottschaller is a senior lecturer here at the Courtauld in the Department of Conservation. She's the author of uh, numerous publications, including monographs on Lucio Fontana and Blinky Palermo. She's published very widely on the painting practice of uh, modern and contemporary artists. And this year, she's a Getty Conservation Guest Scholar. So we are missing her very much while she has this wonderful time to focus on her research. Uh, Joy Mazurek has worked for over 20 years at the Getty Conservation Institute in the science department. She specializes in binding media identification of modern paintings, as well as the preservation of early 20th century plastics. And their paper today is titled The Dialectics of Painting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, let me apologize for probably having to go over a few minutes and that's a very cheeky thing to do because we were so strict with our other authors. Um, and the only excuse we have really is um, that we're two authors, so um, apologies. I would like to start with a date book entry by J. DeFeo from April 1984, which lays out our key themes today, quote, what I like best is the fact that work is shuffled up chronologically with all the refinement and expressionism hand in hand over a span of 30 years. At last, no one can say I've moved linearly from abstract expressionism toward hard edge or from color to black and white or the opposite or from large to small or the opposite or from abstract to representation or the opposite, end of quote. This coexistence of diametrically opposed artistic tendencies in DeFeo's work is what we're going to look at in more detail today. How could DeFeo create paintings that are at the same time classical and funky, expressionist and symbolist, emotionally charged and technically restrained, with a sense ridiculous and sublime? These are all terms used by the artist herself in various contexts, and they name the poles between which she was shuttling more and more vividly as time went by, but especially after completing her magnum opus, The Rose, in 1966, and which you see here in an earlier version. Okay, nope, that isn't moving forward. Okay, there we go. Uh, one reason why DeFeo is such a fascinating painter to study from a technical artist or art historical point of view is that her powerful imagery goes hand in hand with documented thoughts, feelings and intermediary stages of her work. But that doesn't mean that reconstructing what she was up to in any one painting was straightforward, on the contrary. As you'll see from some of our updated media descriptions alone, her arsenal of tools, materials, and techniques was unusually varied, unorthodox, and her practice after the rose grew more and more sophisticated and experimental. So, and let me just say a word about what you're looking at here. It's a photograph of her work table, and um, please note the large number of paint cans, different brands, and then this is uh, one of 36 palettes, um, which are in the JD Fair Foundation, where um, she tried out different 
colors, different hues, but also different brands. And um, you'll hear um, quite a bit more about these um, palettes and the paints as we go along. So what we hope to do today, to achieve today, is to give you some insights into key moments of her career from the 1950s, 70s, and 80s, so on work that she made before and after the rose. This chronological structure, of course, goes against what DeFeo praised in the introductory quote, but as far as her passionate relationship to materials and to practice goes, it is instructive to consider her development as an arc. It was an arc that she built from mark making, texture, form, and color all intertwined. She both mastered a huge range of media for specific purposes, while also letting the very same media inform her as to what was possible. To understand better what media choices she really made, Joy carried out scientific binder and pigment analysis with FTAR, TSP, <laughs> GCMS and SEM MediaX on 50 examples that I had taken from 18 paintings in the J.D. DeFeo Foundation. And at that moment, we would like to thank um, Leah Levy and also Dawn and Michael at the Foundation for, for giving us access and providing us with anything we could possibly want. And also Tom Lerner, um, Head of Science at the Getty to um, support the project as well. Although DeFeo in the 1970s experimented with solid panels such as masonite, her preferred painting support was canvas, usually linen, occasionally cotton duck, as you see here on the right. One of the earliest works in our study, untitled from 19, or dated at the moment to 1951, which is the year she received her MA from the University of California, Berkeley, um, is, as you can see on the right, um, stretched to a simple wooden stretcher, which is tall and narrow, and um, that was a format that she would resort to quite often in the 1950s. The left-hand stretcher bar of that stretcher you just saw is stamped with the number 60, indicating the length of the stretcher bar and the name Anko, comma, Inc. The only movement that DeFeo ever embraced in name and to which her energetic multicolored brushwork is indebted in this work was abstract, abstract expressionism. In the late 1940s, both Clifford Still and Mark Rothko exhibited in San Francisco and taught at the California School of Arts, as it was called at the time, while several teachers at DeFeo's own alma mater, UC Berkeley, were taught by Hans Hoffmann in the summers of 1930 and 31. Not only is her choice of support, cotton duck, associated with the abstract expressionists who needed canvas widths beyond those of regular linen, but Anko, a Glendale, New York-based stretcher maker, also supplied these auxiliary supports to Barnett Newman and Jackson Pollock in the mid to late um, 1940s. Carmen Kusungaro in her essays on Newman and Pollock described the same flimsy stretchers without crossbars or keys. I doubt that too much can or should be read into these correspondences, but they point perhaps to the genealogy of her artistic and one could argue material beginnings. The other noteworthy feature of this work is DeFeo's resourcefulness in bestowing texture to her paint beyond simple brushed impasto by embedding threads, and you see a detail there on the left, and what appears to be a disc of fabric underneath black paint. You see that on the right. There are passages in this work where it's difficult to distinguish between paint covered threads and paint skins, such as um, in the case of the thin black line that you see, let me see here, here this one, here. Um, which media analysis identified as probably an oil and alkyd mixture. This probable is a first indication as to how difficult it is to distinguish by analysis alone whether a paint is pure linseed oil or pure alkyd or a mixture of the two. Visually, the stringy quality of line has become synonymous with Pollock's technique of dripping and pouring, for which she mostly used alkyd house paint and which she was the technique of which she was perfecting at the very same time in the, 19, in the 1950s. Alkyd resins are a form of polyester and alkyd house paint is usually modified with typically over 55% drying oil. It is sold in cans, dries considerably more quickly than pure oil paint, and as you can see here in the um, brown background of the painting where it was used, it levels upon drying. Torso, also from, well, it's 
around the same period, let's say 1952, is probably one of the few paintings that she made while living on a scholarship in Europe. The form of a truncated human body is here matched by paint with a body. Defeo recalled in a lecture at UC Santa Cruz in 1989 that she was using pigments and materials that, quote, I could just get my hands on anywhere and any way I could while I was traveling, end of quote. And in this case, paint samples taken from the dark red, black, and green areas show that she again used alkyd, while the white paint might be a mixture of oil and alkyd. The dark red pigment, um, which you see in the detail on the right hand side, is PR1, a synthetic monoacer pigment, which due to its tendency to bleed is generally not used in high quality artist's paints. And the green paints that you see there in the big form here is um, chromium oxide green. Crucial aspects of DeFeo's future practice are already emerging here, such as the progressive tightening of the composition towards the center, the interplay of linear and more rounded shapes, and the desire to differentiate not just between hues, but also between different types of paint topography. One of the recurring themes in DeFeo's correspondence and lectures about what her materials made her do and vice versa is about her early use of oil, which she abandoned after the rose for what she called acrylic and mixed media. She made no bones about the fact that acrylic was in some sense an unhappy, albeit prolonged interlude for her in the 1970s, supposedly followed by a return to her beloved oil paint in the 1980s. However, the analysis results we got for her paintings do not fully corroborate this embrace of oil paint. It is informative to consider in this context the other already debunked myth of her career in material terms, namely her conviction that it was the lead white content of the oil paint she said she used for the rose and which she blamed for her later health troubles as we already heard from Catherine. But scientific analysis carried out in the mid 1990s showed the work actually has a very low lead content. DeFeo was so strapped for cash for most of her career that at one point in the 1950s, she was even caught stealing paint from a hardware store. Yet the rose, and um, before I go to the next image, um, can I just point out the, the number, the great number of paint cans again? Um, but yet the rose famously weighs almost a ton, and the receipt from 1971 by the Bay City Paint Company, which you see there on the left, and where she bought all of her paint for the painting, talks about paint generically in the receipt. In photographs of her work, we only ever see paint cans, not tubes. House paint is always sold in cans. Acrylic paint, however, often comes in jars, cans, plastic bottles, as well as tubes. But oil paint doesn't, it's usually sold in tubes. In a 1979 lecture at the Oakland Museum, DeFeo described how the massive amount of paint of the rose could only hold its own weight because she at one point started to mix Prime Right, a commercial primer that contained wax and that she also bought at Bay City Paint Company with the other paint. Such primers usually contain cheap fillers such as chalk and barium sulfate, not the expensive lead white. More importantly, this admixture of the primer allowed her to achieve the desired sculptural effects by hardening the paint to a degree that she could carve linear rays into it. This is why I think there might be a lot less lead white than expected. Um, next one. So now back to the question of oil paint and why DeFeo insisted that she used oil paint in periods which according to scientific and photographic documentation, such as this one, suggests she was not really using, or at least not to the extent that she said or she thought she was. Alka house paint will sometimes be described on the label of a can as oil-based, which technically might be correct as about half the content is oil, but chemists and conservatives would always call it an alkyd. And before I go to the next image, let me just um, point out this um, flyer or leaflet, which is also part of the foundation, which um, you know, gives you a whole range of different kinds of interior and exterior paints, sold and cans. And then you can also see this very same um, color chart here on the wall in her studio. Nothing about DeFeo's personality suggests that she would um, that she did what other artists occasionally are said to have done in the early days of acrylics and other synthetic media 
which is claim the use of oil paints when they simply did not want it to be known that they were using a supposedly inferior product. De Fay could never have constructed the rose as she did from pure soft oil paint, even if she had been able to afford it. She needed tough resins like pine resin that are added to alkyd paints and primers in which we identified in many paintings of hers. I think she simply did not discriminate between house paint and artists oil paints and call them both oil. And this is another uh, one of the palettes I already mentioned where you've got a mixture of um, artist paints in the top row with um, where she's very carefully labeled the paints and you can tell from the brand names whether they are artist paints, not necessarily whether it's acrylic or oil or gouache, but um, and then in the row below where the yellow issues are, you've got a mixture of house paints and artist paints. Um, as also mentioned at the outset, binder identification is not straightforward. It requires informed interpretation, which in the case of De Feo, who substituted unorthodox materials like cornstarch, biscuit, and eggshells for dry pigment, and who mixed acrylic with oil is even more complicated. And then there is also the subject of an object's biography. According to analysis of two paint samples from Song of Innocence, which you see here, it was also painted with alkyd on canvas at roughly one by one meter. This is also a very large work with all the cost implications already discussed. She painted the work at the Filmer studio where she um, made the, the rose, where light came streaming in from two opposite bay windows. And it was this raking light that inspired her to swap her brush for a palette knife. The sharp, sometimes bulging edges of every mark contrasts with the smoother, depressed core sections of each stroke. Like the palette knife users Hans Hoffmann and Clifford Still, she demonstrates that one doesn't need a brush to be expressive. The organic fluidity of the streaked, barely there yellow and red, combined with an infinite range of gray shades, is fully her own. In a diary entry from January 1984, DeFeo talks about Song of Innocence being badly damaged. Quote, it even started to bleed and go opaque with my cleaning method, but liquid saved it and some second sense told me all the original pigments. I actually did repainting on a piece 30 years old, end of quote. Liquin is a viscous, mostly transparent alkyd medium by Windsor and Newton, which you really grew to love in the 1980s and sometimes added to oil paint to speed up the drying process. It is possible that regular oil paint is present in Song of Innocence, but is masked by the alkyd, which probably was also her repainting medium. In addition, we got a match um, for Acryloid B67, an acrylic varnish that was supplied by a conservator in 1989. So all these material interventions from 1957, 84 and 89 are now all part of the object's biography and make it more complicated to distinguish what's what. Defey famously dropped out of the art world for three years after she finished the rose after years of grueling and obsessive work, her breakup with Wally Hedrick and her move to Larkspur. There she found herself in different circumstances. This photo gives you an idea of how cramped her new workspace was, which made working on large formats, formats excuse me, a challenge. In addition, she had stopped smoking and the diluent for oil, turpentine, quote, almost acted like an aphrodisiac towards smoking, she explained, and which she therefore wanted to avoid. All four works we examined from the 1970s, such as Makara, which you see here on the right in the photo, are on custom-made smooth masonite panels with articulated frames that protect the edges. Her new body of work was inspired by so-called primitive sculptures and reliefs and reduced to mostly black, gray, and white hues. She also strove for more illusionistic space and volume with a translucent quality. That, as well as her desire to bring in drawing elements, and you can see that in the detail, which is a detail taken from the Akara, um, would call for a layered painting approach in which one can achieve a greater saturation through transparent media. In a letter to Henry Hopkins from 1978, she wrote, quote, I can't separate concept and technique because the medium does indeed become the message, end of quote. The new media we found in these works are acrylic and vinyl paint. 
She consulted at least two books on synthetic media, which um, you, if you know uh, what you're looking for, you can see it sitting here on the stool. One of them, Painting with Synthetic Media from 1964, is an informative book with an appendix by Henry Levison on modern pigments. I have a feeling it didn't stay in print long um, because of product placement issues. Henry Levinson was the founder of Permanent Pigments, which since 1955 had been manufacturing the Liquitex acrylic cane range, and Russell Woody, the book's main author, shamelessly promoted both Liquitex range over all the other brands in the book, as well as his own work, which is shockingly mediocre. But what makes it a great reference, nonetheless, is that Woody interviewed many other painters and relayed their descriptions of painting process, as well as brand preference. In the case of Elaine de Kooning, and you see her painting up here, um, she started to use Liquitex in 1958 for depictions of corridas she saw in Juarez, Mexico. Perhaps it was Helen Frankenthaler's yeah, um, choice of Leonard Bucot's rival product, Aquatec, that led to her getting short shrift in the book. At any rate, De Feo might have felt encouraged by these examples of other female abstract expressionists who were forging a path through the thicket of new media. De Feo in the 1970s generally used, as I said earlier, the media description acrylic and mixed media, which can mean lots of things. So we asked ourselves, was she mixing acrylic and polyvinyl acetate together, PVA, for example, in, in the shape of um, Elmer's glue, which is a very popular um, white wood glue in America, resin W in Britain. And so that and acrylic, uh, which, for example, could have come uh, into the mix as solivar varnish, um, which is acrylic based. Or was she using the new artist's vinyl acrylic emulsion paints, New Masters and Hypla? And you can see a Hypla container there. Or were some of her house paints based on acrylic and vinyl mixtures as they still are today? The answer is probably all three in addition to various other mixed media materials. In Cygnus from 1975, for example, there are scraps of paper, bits of foil and black self-adhesive tapes all of which add to the sculptural quality of the tight, condensed heart shape. De Feo's own photographic documentation of her process shows that the work evolved very slowly on two adjacent panels. We see construction and deconstruction in action in which a new tool, the spray gun, played an important role. She applied both white ground layers and white paint layers with it while elaborate tapings at different stages with tissue, fabric, and transparent sheeting mask the core composition. Um, and let me just sort of point out, so you see the, the beginnings of that um, composition. Sometimes she even had to stand on a ladder and then um, not entirely sure if this is the correct sequence, but you see the transparent sheeting in the center here masking the rest of the composition. These are the bits of tissue that she taped down in order to then um, spray paint around it and sharpen the composition and then you here in the middle you've also got some tissue bottom right is of course uh, the spray gun and then there's some more liquid text bottles sitting in the on a table nearby and these are two details of that work. Um, Defer wrote that Cygnus was started with acrylic and finished with oil and we found on the right hand panel of the work oil with gypsum, white and black acrylic, and matte grainy white paint that contains gypsum, vinyl acrylic emulsion, microcrystalline wax, and alkyd. So this is the paint here, a detail from there that contains all the things I've just read out. Um, this is uh, the black acrylic paint. And then here, I'll show you that detail in order to give you an idea of what that sprayed um, area looked like. In this detail, the two different white paints um, on the left can really only be differentiated under UV, although I would say, you know, once you know what you're looking for, it's easier. Um, and so you've got two different uh, paint mixtures on top of each other, but in UV, they become quite easily distinguishable. So it's complicated. And DeFeo said, quote, but I don't enjoy the use of acrylic. That's why, when finances became less strained in the 1980s, she more or less abandoned acrylics in 1982. In 81, she also moved into a very spacious work loft studio in Oakland, 
This meant a more comfortable return to working on large scale and in pairs was possible, such as on verdict one and verdict two. Verdict number one is a masterpiece that you see here that she finished in 82, and it still contains everything from drying oil to acrylic, alkyd, as well as paraffin wax and beeswax. The waxes are probably present because she liked a product called Dorland's Wax Medium, which contains paraffin, beeswax, and microcrystalline wax, and which of course imparts more body, I don't want to say muscle, um, and viscosity to paint. In letters to Jim Kelly from November 81, she talks about having to hang in there with acrylic because the canvases are too large for her to consider oil paint. But three months later, she tells Kelly that she got so, quote, aggravated with acrylic that I switched to oil midstream. And these um, images uh, give you an, uh, an idea of how, again, she's sort of beginning to tighten the composition more and more as she goes along. In this particular period, um, DeFeo was fascinated by the triangular shape of the sonic boom, a photo of which she had found in Scientific American. Her constant refinement of how to merge sharp and round forms within a single composition comes nowhere to a more satisfying solution, I feel, than here. Extensive amounts of paper strips and self-adhesive tapes helped her not only to define the contours, but also turn into proper collage elements. In an interview with C.J. Stick from 1988, she said that, quote, when an edge is supposed to be square, straight, true, and whatnot, I can't tape that edge enough times in order to make it absolutely correct, you know? Well, we do know when we see this photo of all or some of the used tapes on the windowsill. So this, I think, are all the discarded tapes. And let me just go back for a second to this intermediary stage where you've got quite a bit of tape still there where she's painting um, a black line here, a black line there. But then also this um, area is this one under UB where you see some black tapes that remained. These are bits of paper that remained there. And then this is an interesting area because the what's now red is also paper, but painted red. And then later on, she added a bit of self-adhesive tape to that. Um, from the mid 1980s to her death in 89, she worked on very large and very small paintings. She continued to compose achromatically, but also became more confident in her use of color than ever. In the Alabama Hills series from 1986, which DeFeo liked, likened to internal landscapes, she combined particularly impasto passages with carefully modulated hues, smooth passages with neutral hues, dry stoke, drugs, sorry, with liquid drips. And this is really, I think, just a liquid drip, um, but she must have held the painting at a funny angle to let it move that way. In works like these, um, which I think are both sublime and ridiculous, um, we witness the evidence of so much accumulated tacit knowledge in her wrists and eyes that um, makes it even more heartbreaking that she didn't live longer. About 10 years before her death, DeFeo explained that, quote, the process becomes a play between my control over the materials and an open or permissive attitude towards technique, allowing it to mold the image as it will. But then just a year before her death, this early permissive attitude worried DeFeo because she, quote, started doing at an early age things that would horrify conservationists at a later time. This worry is essentially unfounded, but her process still confounds. The complex body of work that DeFeo left behind continues to exert its magic, like all things that can't be fully understood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia and Joy. It's really amazing kind of forensic focus on what she was up to, this idea of trying to confound or uh, future worries for conservators. Fascinating, um, fascinating way to think about the life of the object, which we've heard about in other ways, about being entangled with questions of aging and so on that Catherine just raised. So what I'm going to do is um, invite Lucy and Catherine, as well as Joy, to join us and to um, to um, take some questions, but also I thought that, so we can all keep an eye on the chat and if you see one that you would like to engage with, then please do jump in. But I thought that we might 
um, start by seeing if you had any questions or comments to make to each other about your about your paper. So I'm going to sort of hand it back to you to see what your thoughts were on your fellow panelists. You can, I think you can just unmute because it's just the, the five of us um, here. I know that Lucy and Catherine, you felt there was some um, interesting connections that were very clear to us on the outside, um, thinking about the entanglement of the body um, across your various investigations. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, <laughs> I was just checking I was unmuted. Um, yeah, absolutely. And actually all the way, way through Catherine's paper, I was kind of thinking about... Um, the really kind of beautiful ways in which um, it kind of picked up some of the tensions and then and then explored them really beautifully in terms of that idea of the politics of care. It really struck me that there is this kind of connection, what you described, I think, as a connection between lived experience and abstract principles. But I was also really struck, actually, in, in um, a relationship between Catherine, your paper um, and the paper that that you were presenting, Pia, um, about messiness. And, and Catherine, you talked about the messiness of the body. There's that sense of a kind of messiness of the studio and the clutter that we saw in some senses, um, particularly, I think, in the, in the Fillmore Street studio. And I, I just kind of wondered whether you, I, either all of you, had some thoughts about that question of messiness, because I feel like it's a literal thing, but there was also a kind of metaphorical way in which you were touching on that. And there was a sort of messiness to some of those surfaces as well. Um, and, the, and the processes of, of not quite accurately taping those canvases, which is really hard. Um, it's, it's not really a question. Um, it's more of a kind of theme that struck me listening to both of you and thinking about, about that question of kind of bodies and messiness and paint and clutter. Absolutely, thanks Lucy. Kathleen, Pia, Joy, any, any responses that you'd like to make? There's something I can offer. Um, I was struck by a lot of um, comments that DeFeo herself made about how, you know, maybe encapsulated by the last quote about um, sort of letting the images emerge from the material. And, you know, and as we've heard also from Catherine, it, it was definitely a, um, a painful process at times. And um, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to conjure the analogy of, of giving birth, but you know, but she worked on these works for a very, very long time. There were many different stages that she sort of had to undergo and things had to sort of germinate. Um, and probably then also not surprisingly, it was also quite difficult for her to then sometimes decide when something was done. Um, that's what I've understood also from talking to Leah about the process. And so I think, yes, the, the messiness is uh, definitely part of the process because the, it, you know, from, from a material point of view, the, the interplay that we often talk about in, in, you know, our specialism about how sometimes it's the material giving you an idea and sometimes you need to make the material do what you want it to, that that's always a, a, a sort of struggle and a give and take. But I think she, partic she was particularly fearless and there was one other reference for example where she talked about um mixing ash from mount st helens into her you know she was willing i think to try literally anything and not in order to um to get a medal for being the most experimental artist but i but i think she she had a very um visceral and tactile relationship to her surface so you talking about um the muscular, um, I've never thought about it, but it made, you know, it made a lot of sense because I think there's, yes, it's, it's, it's even literally a, a, a physical relationship she has to her works, to the surface, to how she's wringing it out of the, how she's wringing the images out of the, the material. Can I can just add to that a little bit. I almost wanted to kind of go back on myself um, listening, um, here as you were talking and I was thinking actually that looks quite neat <laughs> you, know, <laughs> uh, you know there's clearly like a huge amount and this is the the interesting dialectic between the kind of mess and the control that that DeFeo herself was kind of constantly exploring and I was thinking well actually you know 
she had these very kind of confined working spaces and, and we see her using them to the kind of maximum of their potential um, and really kind of getting everything that she can out of them. And when I was thinking about the politics of care in her work, I, when I was looking back through notes I'd made on her journals, care is a word that comes up, but she's worried about being too careful about the work. She's worried it's become overworked or over. So it has a different, a slightly different valence that I didn't really have time to talk about, but that I think, um, yeah, it, it kind of maybe complicates some of the things that I was saying actually. Um, but I think it also has a kind of ethical point to it. And that was a connection that I kind of felt particularly strongly with with Lucy's paper when you were talking about the connection between the individual and the collective understood in kind of varying um, layers from a kind of intimate social circle to a wider artistic milieu to then the kind of wider socio-political um, environment of America in the 1960s. So that was just something that, um, that struck Thank me. You, Catherine. Um, that actually leads quite nicely given that you've just um, brought up the concluding lines of Lucy's um, really beautiful presentation because we have a question here from Tom Day um, in the in the chat which um, picks up where where Lucy left off really um, so first of all thanks uh, he says for a great first session so I was intrigued by the photo um, um, DeFeo added or amended to the exhibition invite and it seems to index explicitly ex index sorry index explicitly notions of domestic labor in the body in a witty way and so the question to the panel is if DeFeo made other performance oriented works which center the body either in photography film or in in live performance and I think this question of the where where the body is in her work is something that pressed on all of your papers in in quite radically different ways I think. Yeah, that's a, a really beautiful question, actually, because I think I, I came across that that um, kind of closing example quite recently as I was browsing old auction sites, actually. Um, and I think absolutely it's a joke, kind of a joke, isn't it? it? That there's something really sort of witty. But that idea of performance, I think, kind of hits the nail on the head in terms of that that kind of presence of the body. And we see it in kind of but I think most most commonly actually in photographs of, of DeFeo with her work, where she is really kind of explicitly posing in front of with sometimes almost kind of merging into that work. And she almost kind of turns in those photographs, she sort of turns painting into quite a kind of performative space. And, and, and again, I, I kind of don't really mean that in the Harold Rosenberg action painting sense, but she's somehow kind of using her body to um, invigorate the, the object of the painting or the surface of the painting in, in a really interesting way, I think. Um, so to think about some of that, some of that practice in, in relation to performance, I think is, is really interesting. Um, or possibly even in relation to theatre. Yeah, I would just say that I agree. Um, it's particularly apparent in the photographs, both um, there are some photographs where DeFeo herself kind of um, performs for the camera um, with kind of costumed elements. Um, but there's also photographs in which she's clearly creating environments. So it's less about performing for the camera and more about kind of maybe as Lucy was just kind of saying, creating these quite theatrical worlds within worlds. There's some particularly stunning ones where she used kind of silver foil to cover um, the interiors that she was then photographing herself in. So yeah, I think it's a great question and a very productive line of thought um, for thinking about DeFeo's work. Mm -hmm. I was um, also intrigued into this idea of the producing an environment with you, the discussion of the various tins or tubes or absence of tubes and cans and so on. This question of the kind of the economics of of paint and what it costs, the cost. We always think of the cost of the rose in very, very kind of charged bodily, psychological kind of creative terms. But in fact, there's other kinds of costs attached to the choices that that are made. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that. Well, the the, the one incident that I mentioned um, in the 50s when she was caught stealing two cans of paint, one black, one red, um, cost her her teaching certificate. And I'm also mentioning that because um, one other question here is about what role she had yeah. as a 
as a oh. teacher's role model. And so she wasn't allowed to teach for a long time, which of course was a, a tragedy because that would have been her um, income, you know, her independent income, especially after she separated from Wally Hedrick. Uh, but, you know, I, so th there are quite a lot of um, comments where she she's literally, you know, write, writing the odes to how much she loves oil paint and the particular sensuous qualities of it. But then there are also other reflections where she talks about how the fact that she did have to go um, and use more synthetic materials, how that's made her rethink her oil process. So she then began to layer more. Um, but yes, I think the um, the question of how much materials and what they cost and where an artist is in, in their career, I think is, is always an interesting one because, you know, as we know, sometimes artists later in their career sort of remake work in on the scale or with materials they would have preferred and not necessarily everyone feels that that really would have been the better version of it. Um, so I think, you know, when, when uh, in the 80s also after her mother died and she inherited some money with which she could then buy the biggest studio in Oakland, but then she also became a tenured professor at Mills College. That was a really important um, point in her career because it made her more confident. She really didn't have to you know, worry about money on a daily basis. And I think that's also why we then see, for example, in the Alabama Hill series, but also in, in, the, in the other really big works from, from the 80s, which I very much love, so Geisha, for example, and um, similar works, then she really does use the oil exactly where she wants it. And she uses it often in the colored areas because house paints, of course, very, uh, you know, generally speaking, don't come in very bright colors, but they tend to be the more muted tones. So when you think about Pollock um, and other artists who primarily used house paints at a certain point, that also always had an immediate effect on the coloration of, of works because of what colors, the, you know, you, you just don't have that much choice. I'm not sure if that answered your question, um, Joe. Yeah, but, no, it's absolutely, no, it's absolutely fascinating. I, you know, something like Anne Truitt's day books are so fascinating on this, just the, the yeah. worry, the cost of, of not just materials, but, you know, those teaching jobs as an absolute lifeline to being able to do the work that you want to do is, is not an uncommon thread, um, particularly with women artists that, we, uh, that we're so interested in. So it's wonderful. Um, you touched on this, another question, if anyone has anything they'd like to add to this question, what was her role as a professor and a teacher or as a role model, or perhaps as a mentor? I think a number of you mentioned um, her teaching. Was, who, was it Catherine with the, with the photography? Did you? Um, yeah, I, I think that's another really important question um, that, that Pia has already talked to a bit. Teaching was clearly very important um, for DeFeo and, and not being able to do so for a long time was um, a really significant um, problem really um but yeah so that the photography i think my sense is um other people may well know a lot more about this but my sense is that yes it was partly um that uh, she learned through students that she was coming into contact with um, at the San Francisco Art Institute. So, and again, through her contact sheets, you get a sense of, of playfulness, of huge experimentation um, between her and her students and in her talks and discussions about the 70s and 80s, particularly as you go into the 1980s, teaching was clearly hugely generative for her. It, it kind of gave her ideas. Um, it gave her confidence, um, it gave her material support, but it had quite a strong impact on, on both her material experimentation, but also her ideas and what she was doing in the studio. Thank you so much. Um, we are just at six o'clock. So just before we break to go and have a cup of tea for 10 minutes, we're going to reconvene at 10, uh, 10 past six or 10, 10 minutes, wherever you are. But just thank you all so much. What a tremendous, rich and really um, engaging series of presentations. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to hearing um, the next uh, set of papers. So thank you all very much. And we will see you all in 10 minutes. So welcome back, everyone. Um, we hope you had a good break. We are now very excited to start our second part of the symposium with a fantastic lineup of speakers. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Judith Delfiner, 
who is Associate Professor in Contemporary Art History at Paris Nanterre University. The past three years, she has been Editor-in-Chief of Perspective, the journal of the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art, and her work, work focuses on the relationship between the historical avant-garde and American countercultures. She's currently interested in the practice of photocopying, particularly among women artists, and has just completed a manuscript on Jay DeFeo's xerographies. That's a hard one for me to pronounce. Anyway, Judith's title is uh, Jay DeFeo, Xerox Images, and uh, Judith, please take it away. Thank you, uh, Pierre, for your very nice introduction. I thank you and Joe for having invited me to this fabulous symposium. I also would like to thank warmly Leah Levy for her precious help during my years of research on DeFeo. So I've decided to focus my presentation on JDFL Xerox images. I'd like to introduce my presentation with a quick anecdote by a colleague at DeFeo's at Mills College, Mary Ann Milford, who was teaching art history and who remembered DeFeo using the copy machine there. Quote, Initially, Jay was making Xerox prints using the Xerox machine in the art office at Mills College. Eventually, our incredibly observant and wonderful administrative assistant, Marilyn Mary, was concerned about how much ink and paper Jay was using and arranged for a Xerox printer to be put in her office in the painting studio, end quote. So this anecdote reveals how captivated DeFeo was with new technology that was, in many ways, unpredictable. So this is a subject I have devoted an entire manuscript to. Here I will limit myself to raising a few points that I consider essential. Although DeFeo's photocopies are inseparable from the rest of her work, this unique corpus seems particularly worthy of study, not just because of the originality of the Xerox images themselves, but also because it sheds new light on her creative process. JDFO's activity in the field of photocopying spanned the last 15 years of her life from 1975 to her death in 1989. During these 15 years, she made hundreds of photocopies, which she carefully stored but never exhibited during her lifetime. These corporate. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Are you going to screen share? Because. Yes. Oh, okay. Just yes. Make... Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this corpus seemed highly convincing aesthetically and particularly rich in terms of the theoretical and historical references it draws on. While classifying these images, DeFeo often used the word Xerox, titling some of her fine Xerox studies. Analysis of DeFeo xerographies reveals that she used this technique for three distinct purposes. First, Xeroxing objects, ordinary, everyday objects that she had to hand. Second, Xeroxing her own work, paintings, drawings, photographs, etc., of that of others. And third, Xeroxing books, periodicals, articles, etc. As we shall see, DeFeo did not create any hierarchy in the different uses she made of Xeroxing. A photocopy of an advertisement, for example, could serve as the starting point for several pieces. In other words, there was no difference in status for her between xerography as a document and xerography as a preliminary study for the realization of a work of art. At any time, xerography as a document could be the starting point for a series of pieces. So I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> um, okay. For example, she photocopied an advertisement for the office furniture brand Herman Miller cut out a piece of it and glued it onto a photocopy of a Japanese print that you can see on the left, thus creating a collage of photocopies. And these new works served as the starting point for a painting apex that you see in the middle. Furthermore, it is important to stress that DeFeo did not differentiate between the hand and the machine. What interested her was the shape, whether ready-made or handmade, and the way it could mutate into another shape. In the tissue box series, DeFeo explored the multiple variations of the motif whose shapes seemed to unfold in space. The creative process at work in DeFeo was underpinned by this idea of self-engendering shape. And in this respect, the technique used, be it xerography or some other more traditional medium did not really matter. Unlike photography, which required a relatively long time between the taking of the image and the printing on photographic paper, xerography was almost instantaneous 
allowing the artist to follow as closely as possible the ideas and intuitions generated by the experiments carried out with the photocopier. It was the machine's responsiveness together with its capacity to easily vary the scale of the motif as well as the contrast between the whites and the blacks that made the medium so attractive to the fail. Xeroxing allowed her to produce ongoing series as evidenced by the panels of images that framed the works in progress in her studio. These photographs belong to a series of views of the Theo studio taken in, in the 80s. They shed light on how our works were produced and how the arrangement of the various elements mounted on the walls contributed to the creation of the composition in progress. These data seems to me of key importance for an understanding of her work. The field worked in and on the studio at the same time, the progress of the work of the moment leading to the continuous reorganization of the images on the walls. More often than not, the artist juxtaposed images that were very similar in composition, but differed in some detail or other, such as the nature of the objects, their arrangement, the intensity of the contrast between the whites and the blacks. As you can see in the picture on the right, what she seems to have been looking for was the minute variation in the passage from one to another, so as to construct a continuous succession of self-generating shapes. The arrangement of images within these compositions attests to the correspondences that the artist established between works from different series. Showing these uninterrupted sequences reveals how a new shape, rather than being a creation, was derived from a previous shape, with the fail following the thread of the self engendering from one composition to the next. Placed end to end, the xerography must have seemed to her more than any other medium capable of exposing creative power in action in an extension of the major work she was working on. These operative process in which the elaboration of a major work spawns a myriad of secondary works came as a revelation to Defeo while she was studying Picasso's Guernica during her studies at Berkeley. Quote, this class made such an impression on me that I've kind of worked that way even since. I mean, the whole seminar was based on looking, considering, let's say, a major work as well as Guernica, but also examining all the ideas that Picasso realized that came out of the piece once it was started. And things became valid in their own right, you know, the drawings and so forth and so on. So we were to start a major work and let things happen, to pull ideas out of it on a smaller scale in multiple media, whatever struck us, you know. I suppose if we had chosen to abandon the work eventually, it would have been okay. But it was that that triggered off an endless stream of self-induced imagery, end quote. This dynamic of creation between a major work and smaller scale works derived from it can be observed in the realization of the rose which she placed at the heart of a creative process. On a smaller scale, we find the same dynamic between the work in progress and the panels of images that populated the walls of a studio. These secondary works link to a major work from which they derived while remaining autonomous, conform to the logic of the fragment as conceived by romantic theory. It is not possible to expand on this question here, but it seems to me that in a general way, the field's work was profoundly influenced by romantic thought. This diagram by De Feo describes how the earlier works proceeded from the rose in the same way as the later compositions, revealing the fragmentary dynamics out of which an uh, entire of uh, grew. As mentioned before, in the economy of her work, xerography in no way had the status of a preliminary study for the realization of her work in a more noble medium. To take the example of the tissue box series, the artist explored the motif from painting to drawing to xerography without any hierarchy or chronology. In one of her notes, she mentions a circular attitude in reference to her working method in which the same motifs regularly reappear as in a loop, which became a kind of signature. The motif of the loop here doubled is central to this photocollage, which is now part of the collections of the Saint-Georges-Pompidou. 
This image shows the continuity between the organic and the inorganic. The body of the vacuum cleaner replaces the trunk of the tree and the hose become part of the branches. In Defeo's view, quote, there is not such a thing as inanimate matter and that there is God or divinity in all matter and it's all living energy, end quote. For her, life was fundamentally embodied in shape and its ability to perpetually evolve. Whether it is a natural phenomenon endowed with the capacity to grow or a human product, everything happens as if matter becomes life as soon as it takes shape at the very moment when it's made line. In Defeo's work, drawing is above all, above all the definition of a line and as such, it transcends the question of the medium itself. The branches of the trees form curves that are taken up by the undulations of the vacuum cleaner hose. On the upper left side, you can see a single drawing of a lampstand with three xerographies that were derived from it. The first use of xerography was in this respect very close to a graphic practice like drawing. As she said herself, quote, I do a lot of Xeroxing, like people do sketching. It's a sketching device. Oftentimes, I'm not really quite sure what will come out of it, end quote. Xerography did not appear in her work like some advanced technique for obtaining images of a new aspect, but rather as a means of returning with greater ease to the most archaic medium of drawing. For xerography, the artist found the simplicity of the monochrome shape obtained in an almost instantaneous way. Quote, I've never been good at draftsmanship. I can't do quick sketches. So photography gave me a whole bunch of views of something. Then I would go from that into Xerox, end quote. More fundamentally, xerography allowed her to refine her perception. Quote, copies of drawings really helped me to see the light how to get a certain crispness and sharpness of outline missing in the originals, end quote. Although the copy machine had no viewfinder, it allowed her in the same way as photography to reveal form by working on the values of shadow and light out of which it is constructed. Although the multiple as such never interested the artist, she saw the copy machine as a unique tool for producing an infinite or almost infinite number of variations from a motif, variation that she envisaged as a way of accessing the lucidity, a moment of truth, quote. In a way, it's both painful as well as rewarding to finally have moments of lucidity, end quote. In some cases, she used xerography as a drawing method in its own right. The xerography you see on the left was made from a drawing in which Defeo extended the guiding lines with a compass and some putty erasers. The image at the center is a photocopy of a drawing without adding any object in which she had forced the blacks, the significantly modifying the rendering of the original drawing. And it was uh, from this reproduction that they feel composed the image on the left, a xerography of a xerography in which the black are pushed to their highest level of intensity, absorbing the whole right hand part of the composition. It is well known that the more one multiples the xerographic process by making xerographies of xerographies, the more the shadows are accentuated to the extent that they occupy a more important place than the objects themselves. Through this process, the film shows a kind of mise-en-scene of the shadows themselves, a kind of shadow theater. Now, if such images refer to a notion of archaism, it is precisely because they evoke an age of representation that predates mimesis, the stage of the shadow where the drawing resulted from the projection of interposed bodies. I refer, of course, to the fable about the origins of drawing told by Pliny the Elder, who described how the daughter of the potter Butagis Wishing to keep a direct trace of a lover, decided to draw the profile of his face via his shadow cast on the wall. These, the, the evident archaism of some of Defeo's xerographies is due, on the one hand, to the marked presence of shadows that refer to the idea of the origins of drawing as recounted in the Butadis fable, and on the other hand, to the technique of contact imprint that dates back to the origins of representation as evidenced by prehistoric hands, which are among the earliest artistic representations in the history of humanity. 
While the fair did not make any black and white, black and white Xerox handprints, she featured them extensively in her chemigram series. The redundant presence in her xerographies of a precision instrument such as compasses, magnifying glasses, and putty erasers suggests that these objects were an extension or rather a substitute for a hand and a hand for herself. In these series, the instruments seem to have a weight, even a corporality. The shadows are so emphatic that they seem to be draws with charcoal. The emphasis on shadows and the almost palpable presence of matter give these images a marked archaic quality. The process reached a kind of paroxysm in an image like this one, in which the trace of the reference has completely disappeared in favor of a totally abstract composition reminiscent of cave paintings. Through the underlying presence of the hand through the tool, the fair refers to the very condition of the artist who, according to Henri Faucillon, represents the most advanced type as well as being a continuation of prehistoric man. These tools placed on a photocopy of Splatten thus articulate this dual temporality which brings together the two ends of the arrow of time of which they provide a precipitate. If these compasses refer to the origins of representation, they also refer in the same movement to the most accomplished classical art as testified by this page from a sketchbook of Leonardo da Vinci. This example illustrates, in my opinion, the singular use that the film makes of Xeroxing, employing a state-of-the-art technology to produce images with a pronounced archaism. This singular use of the copy machine reflects a circular conception of temporality that governs all of our work, according to which the present does not mark any progression in relation to the past, but rather actualizes it as evidenced by the loop motif. Finally, I would like to conclude my presentation on the evocative power of the field Xerox images by drawing attention to the way in which they summon up references to, to the entire Western pictorial tradition in particular through the recurrence of the fold and the drape widely used by the fair. Comparison of her Xerox with a painting of El Greco reveals the respective mise en scène of the effects of draping. It seems to me that the Baroque theatrality that Gilles Deleuze analyzed in his book on the fall is at work in some of the fair's geographies. The overflow of one art into the other the escalating cascade of folds evoked by Deleuze on the subject of Baroque aesthetics would have a particular resonance in the case of the imprint, in the sense that it would be an internal phenomenon by which the various senses would enter into contact according to a contamination of synesthesia type. Indeed, what seems to me characteristic of the field xerography is the way they actualize a kind of indecisiveness between touching and seeing images so that our hand is moved, as Georgie Duberman wrote in a more general way about contact images. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you, Julie. That was absolutely wonderful. There's, there's so many questions already piling up in my own head that I can't wait for us to get to the Q&A. So thank you. Lots of thought provoking uh, ideas in there. Um, but before we get to discuss it a bit more, we will um, have our next speaker, Suzanne Hudson, uh, present her work. And uh, the title of Suzanne's uh, lecture today is called Encore. And uh, let me say a few things about um, Suzanne before we go there. So Suzanne Hudson is Associate Professor of Art History and Fine Arts at the University of Southern California, where she is completing a term as a faculty fellow in the Society of Fellows. Her writing has appeared in such, such publications as Paquette, Art Journal and October. A regular contributor to Art Forum for almost 20 years, she also has written numerous essays for international exhibition catalogues and artist monographs. She's the author of books, including Robert Ryman, Used Paint, Agnes Martin, Night Sea, and Contemporary Painting. And she is the co-editor of Contemporary Art. She's currently at work on Better for the Making, Art Therapy Process, a study of the therapeutic origins of art making within American modernism. 
So Suzanne, we're looking forward to your presentation. Take it away. Thank you so much. Give me just a moment to pull my screen up as well. Um, okay, thank you so much, Pia and Joe, for the invitation and to everyone who's already presented for such an incredibly rich um, conversation that I feel like I'm entering into as um, kind of encore too. There are aspects of what I will share now that we'll pick up on uh, many dimensions of what we've already uh, been hearing and talking about, but I will jump right in. So writing for the San Francisco Sunday Examiner and Chronicle, reporter Gerald Adams profiled Jay DeFeo in late September 1969. The Rose, which she had completed in 1966, was unduly proximate. The major work of her life, as Adams put it here, proved overwhelming in its significance for the author and presumptively his subject. DeFeo had worked on The Rose for nearly a decade and it was, by this time, already a fabled, obdurately material ground of accumulated and carved paint thickened into a tensile sculptural relief. Photographs documenting its ever penultimate stages of development had circulated in catalogs and art magazines since the 1950s. And as uh, we know, it was also uh, mythologized in Bruce Connor's 1967 film, The White Rose, which shows the massive structure supine, wrapped and harnessed, emerging from DeFeo's Fillmore Street apartment through a choreography of man and machine that has also been likened to birthing through the womb. At the time of this publication though, the rose hung at the San Francisco Art Institute after recent installations at the Pasadena Museum and the San Francisco Museum of Art. Yet Adams hardly discusses the rose beyond a cursory indication of its weight and size, less characterizing its achievement than assuming its apotheosis. Descriptive language only appears in a caption beside a large image of DeFeo, as you see here at right, who poses before it when it was installed at the San Francisco Museum of Art. The caption at the right, and I, I apologize, I know it's so small, so I will read it to you. It reads, quote, the painting that changed a woman's life is of the abstract expressionist school. From its simple white center, the rose stretches outward in petal-like ripples, which become craggy mountains of gray, blue, and black. Artist Jay DeFeo worked on it for eight years ever changing it and adding more oil to the canvas that now weighs some 2,300 pounds. By contrast, in the text proper, we learn that DeFeo, pictured now donning a sun hat, gardening in Marin County amidst the bucolic if threadbare backdrop of a former estate, has emerged from the long process of its genesis largely intact. She is tendered here as a heroine who finds herself critically lauded but financially insolvent. She confronts, as Adams frames it, quote, an artist's painful dilemma. What do you do for an encore? Stripped of its gratuitous lingering over DeFeo's visage, um, and I should point out an especially treacly passage where Adams appreciates, quote, that the beautiful brunette retains a cute upturned nose and eyes with a perky sparkle, um, the piece is nevertheless useful for how its egregious misogyny exposes the stakes of DeFeo's reception on terms that are habituated elsewhere. And anyhow, the question of what DeFeo might do next was a fair one, one with which she had to contend, and which seems, I think, to have prolonged her work on the rose in the first place. One answer came in 1970, with after image, which we've already seen a couple times today. A mixed media drawing of graphite, tempera, and acrylic with cut and torn tracing paper. It marks DeFeo's return to small scale work with once elemental forces of layering and excision now rendered paper thin. It moreover recalls other collages from the early 1950s and continues the broader interest in assemblage manifest there among Bruce Connor, her partner Wally Hedrick and others, a near generational tendency on both coasts as well as in Europe that was institutionalized in the 1961 Art of Assemblage show at the Museum of Modern Art 
a massive undertaking comprising some 130 artists curated by William Seitz. Uh, for the record, Connor, George Herms, and Jess appeared there, but Hedrick and Jafeo did not. So this figure is derived from a costate cockle appropriated from a book of shells. It is cleaved with bilateral symmetry along a horizontal axis from which its ribs evanesce into something seemingly softer or more pliant, evocative of feathery wings and petals that appear in so many works. And I'm here showing you an installation shot from Dana Miller's retrospective of DeFeo at the Whitney in 2013. Um, and here we see um, especially Annunciation at the far right, um, but many works that I think reverberate on, on this point. Following the title and subtended by the optical thrust that typifies Greenbergian modernism and the United States, Bridget Doherty has discussed it in terms of memory and vision. One can indeed connect after image to the eyes, 1958, shown at Delexi Gallery. Miller herself notes that this pairing forges a binary in which the eyes, quote, enabled her to envision the work ahead of her. And after image looks backward at what she had accomplished in the past. But the titular phenomena of the latter likewise sublates recall and futurity as a contingent registration of sensation that outlasts its stimulus. Indeed, the after image is a useful concept modeling the living on a form that preserves sequence and causation without reifying the image. Walter Hopps, so instrumental in showing the rose in Los Angeles, considered it, quote, a monumental self-portrait and one that might art and one might argue something similar for after image. To be sure, there are works that DeFeo made in these years and in after image and then works made in these years that suggest a more explicitly metonymic reach. So Crescent Bridge One and Crescent Bridge Two uh, were the major paintings that followed, each painted in acrylic and synthetic resin on plywood. Based on DeFeo's dental bridge that replaced teeth, they become an oddly disembodied mountainous landscape, each fang an unlikely summit. Still, I would formulate the apposition of self-portraiture as pertaining not to biography, but to a critical self-consciousness regarding method. After image represents a ceaseless and necessarily unfinished process that relates ongoing concerns to earlier works and the changeable circumstances in which they retain or remake relevance in a vital reciprocity of address and mutual constitution. In this way, DeFeo's positioning was perhaps strategic. David Pagel suggests that DeFeo put significant distance between her new work and the Rose by severing, quote, the relationship between the identity of the work of art and the identity of the artist who made it by, quote, making works of art that looked so different from another, end quote, that they appeared to deny singular authorship. So something like a group show of one. A compelling argument, it nevertheless presumes stylistic coherence as a more stable sign of selfhood than its obverse. This echoes an abstract expressionist trope with broader implication. So think here perhaps um, not of Jackson Pollock, but the ever mercurial and gamely appropriative work of Arshil Gorky, whose critical fortunes um, I think shifted uh, downward as his peers consolidated brand identities that would come to define the post-war achievement of the New York School. It is also undercut by DeFeo's active engagement with the iconography of roses and photo collages, collage, sorry, photographs, collages, and paintings throughout the 1970s to say nothing of the deliberate and recursive returns that structure the hetero heterogeneous and vital works that ranged across media and size, often simultaneously from the early 1950s on. In 1971, DeFeo remarked in a letter, quote, lately I think I have had some insight into my work in terms of continuum. I see the rose as a central effort in my life. With some perspective now, I realize more objectively that all experience and work fed into it. 
Also, now I don't see myself groping for encores. Rather, the rose is providing graciously a kind of feedback, so much growing out of it in terms of future ideas. Then in a journal entry from 1974, amidst conservation efforts on the rose and preparations for a solo show at Leslie Wenger Gallery in September of 1974 that focused exclusively on her work of the 1970s, DeFeo wrote, feeling the necessity of returning to older works, some even 25 years ago, and again ahead to new ones. And furthermore, the total view of all I've done is always a presence at any given moment on current painting, end quote. Undeniably, the total view is possible owing to a lack of sales and DeFeo living with work that spanned the years at different moments throughout her career. Early work predated and then existed alongside the Rose in the Fillmore apartment Coombe studio. Um, and so here I'm showing you um, an earlier image um, that shows both her work and Hedrick's work installed um, in very close quarters. And then we've seen this image as well, um, her working on the rose. But I'm very interested in how um, she starts to um, kind of image this quite differently um, from the 1970s on. Um, and I'll say more about that in a moment. So as Leah Levy, who I should say has been not just to help in uh, helping me to understand this dimension, but really all of what I'm sharing today, um, after she left San Francisco, DeFeo stored her work in the barn and under the house in Ross from 1966 to 1969, and in an offsite facility once she moved to Larkspur in 1969. After the Wenger show, she worried about storage and debated whether to rent storage or pay a friend to store things. Um, and actually on this count, I think another really uh, revealing diary entry uh, shows her wondering when she won't have to support her paintings any longer and when they in turn might support her. When she moved to Oakland in 1980, she kept her works with her, some unfinished paintings that traveled with her from Marin and others as references from still further back. And I'll show you just a couple of these images of which there are many, uh, just to get a sense both of the, the scale of her studio, which we've already heard alluded to when she moved to Oakland um, and began working at Mills, but um, also just to see her the range of works that she kept in close proximity, uh, which I think is very interesting to think about them as kind of physical realizations alongside the Xeroxes um, and what Judith, what you just shared. Uh, so here's a couple more um, images from her Oakland studio with La Brea Torso from 1952 and a much more recent um, image, Hawk Moon. Um, but I'm going to bring us back here to Larkspur. So the 1970s are years marked by what Sarah Cowan has described as DeFeo's archival impulses. Beginning in 1970, DeFeo started taking photographs, and by 1971, she was documenting her studio in a visual diary, thereby taking into her own hands what had only inadvertently manifest through various images of the rose in process. Dana Miller argues that, quote, the camera also functioned as a crucial visual aid, helping her to provide distance on her paintings unavailable in her tight working space and more generally to sharpen her perception of a work. By 1978, DeFeo could cast this line rather even more willfully, taking possession of her inspiration from her own work among the capacious sources from a global history of art to which, her, to which she also appealed. Perhaps not parenthetically, I think it is important that she understood her own work as worthy of such attention. In a thoughtful letter to Henry Hopkins, the director of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, who organized her one person show at UC Berkeley's University Art Museum in 1978, DeFeo explained how she came to achieve a coherent formal lexicon comprised of central geometries, among others, that she could reassemble across statements and media. I'm gonna quote here at some length. I do believe that more so than most artists, I maintain a kind of consciousness of everything I've ever done while I am engaged on a current work. I find myself referring to some of the earliest efforts and always the rose is present in my imagination as a kind of central core of my life's work. 
During the years I worked on it, I sensed its significance as containing the sum total of experience of early years. I was often asked after it was complete, what are you going to do for an encore? Suggesting that every succeeding piece had to be some kind of tour de force, a lesson in one-upmanship for the rose. I did need some years of rest, or let's call it non-painting, after its completion for a number of reasons. But when I once again had a place to work and the energy was restored, I began to see the rose as a storehouse for all the symbol shapes and imagery that went into it, releasing all of the ideas that have come since. I came across a phrase from William Blake years ago, if you have found or made a circle to go into, go into it yourself and see how you would do. It has never really made rational sense to me, but it continues to haunt me. Hopkins would write in term that the primary ingredient in DeFeo's art is time. In 1983, DeFeo would clarify these concerns in something that she called visual concerns, um, that when she returned to work in 1970, quote, instead of bigger and more complex, the rose was a hard act to follow. I returned to, sim to simple statements, not unlike some work of the early 1950s when I was just discovering my vocabulary. I don't consider simple statements lesser necessarily, simply a part of the whole spectrum of my work. This is again part of the circular attitude. Even these modest statements, a reaffirmation of my symbols, are new statements given a different time, emotional climate, new materials to explore. As a useful comparison, Lee Krasner returned to her earlier works in the 1970s as well in the context of reading them for exhibition. She found that with the chasm of a half century, she could objectify her work more fully and appropriate earlier pieces as raw material for a series that took them as the basis for new collages. Hilton Kramer slammed the work that emerged from the literal stuff of the past as quote, a cold blooded act of self-criticism that is also a bizarre form of artistic self cannibalization. Paul, Prack would, Paul Brack would put it differently, it put it in differently sanguine, but still consumptive language in 2001, quote, these painting collages are perfect examples of the theory that artists and their youth feed on the history of art, later on their own ideas and feelings, and in the end on their own work. DeFeo did recycle past work like Krasner with one salient example that we've seen already here today as well, um, being Tuxedo Junction, a work that makes over shards of collage from a 1965 work called the Estocada that she hastily salvaged from the Fillmore apartment on the way out and stored for years thereafter under her bed. She photographed these elements in 1973 and then mounted the salvage debris onto masonite for this composition. She titled it after a Glenn Miller song that was reissued at that time, a veritable homage to reprisal. Alongside such strategies of material experimentation and reuse, in 1982, she returned to oil paint, although Pia, now I, I maybe will qualify some of this, um, after more than a decade of using acrylics. In a particularly affecting set of paintings from the mid 1980s, sensitive evocations of landscape, real and imagined, emerge from non-objective smears. Some paintings depict loosely and effectively the Alabama hills, conjuring the quintessentially Western landscape in the California mountain range east of the Sierra Nevada. These epic and undeniably photogenic geological formations have served as the backdrop for scores of films and television shows since the 1920s, but here appear less formidable than did DeFeo's Oral Bridge. The rounded contours flatten into planes delineating pictorial space as if in silhouette. Geometry offsets amorphousness. Uninflected shapes pick puncture fields of loose brushwork. The Alabama Hills paintings also feature brilliant descriptive applications of gesture. Some, including what I'm picturing here, Alabama Hills number eight, Arctic sunset, register rock face and modulating grisaille, a palette familiar from DeFeo's career decades before. 
against a sometimes fiery pocket of sky. A narrow band of yellow limbing the peak of Arctic sunset both establishes something like illusionistic recession and makes evident how dark the rest of the picture remains. The point that I want to end with here is that DeFeo never really got away from her earlier work, nor did she seem to wish to do so. And perhaps she became increasingly unap unapologetic on this count. Her response to the problem of the encore was not to recreate or to reenact, but rather to engage earlier work in an editorial mode of self-retrospection that was likewise anticipatory. In the absence of exhibitions and public display, and commensurate with a clear-eyed um, position in the face of a compensatory romanticism that redeems neglect for the unwatched experimentation it abets, the existence of earlier work constituted the basis for still more effort rather than encouraged its obviation. As for my own use of encore, I would keep hold of the performative valence of the term, but insist on privileging earlier etymological senses of the encore as being something continuing without cessation, not a repeat or reappearance begged by an audience. The encore might in this way be regarded as an assertion of presence as something not belated, but emphatically reverberating in time. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. That was a wonderful paper. Um, and I have to say that I've um, never really see, seen so clearly as today through your paper, the um, how the rose really does reverberate through time, but how the timelessness, and I think in, you know, in the very last sentences of your paper where you talk about the encore, um, and what it means for you, um, I think the timelessness of her recurring themes um, has never become clearer and, and more impressive. So thank you very much. I'm sure there are going to be questions about that. Um, however, in the meantime, um, we have one more wonderful paper to look forward to. And I um, um, invite Corey to speak next. Um, Corey's paper is titled Sidestepping the Image Directly, The Growth of Jade Affairs Cabbage Rose. Corey is curator of photography at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where she has been a member of the curatorial, curatorial team since 2003. Her interests in photography range from its earliest days to its use as a form of contemporary expression, and her most recent projects include a survey of the 19th century archaeological photographer John Beasley Green, a career retrospective of the work of Derwood Bay, now in view of the Whitney, and a current exhibition entitled Close to Home, Creativity in Crisis, that features seven San Francisco Bay Area artists' responses to the pandemic and social upheavals of 2020. Keller, Corey, wrote about DeFay's use of photography for the Whitney Museum's 2012 monograph and continues to find extraordinary richness and complexity worth exploring in that aspect of her practice. Now, we are looking forward to more explorations, Corey, so please take it away. Thank you, Pia. Let's see if we can do this. I think after a year of Zoom, we'd have it down to a science. There we go. Um, first, I would like to thank Pia and Joe for inviting me to participate and to all the other speakers whose talks have been so illuminating. I feel very lucky to be going last because there's so many resonances between what I'm going to present today and what the other speakers have already talked about that I feel like they've done a great deal of the heavy lifting for me for which I am very grateful. Um, I'd also like to thank the Jay DeFeo Trust, particularly Leah Levy, for responding to my endless esoteric queries, demands for JPEGs, and for their permission to quote here from DeFeo's unpublished journals. Um, for an artist whose practice is so inextricably linked to her use of paint, and whose reputation is so entangled with a single painting at that, to focus on DeFeo's engagement with photography could at first seem tangential and perhaps even perverse. But my contention has been that photography played a far more significant significant role in DeFeo's artistic process than has been traditionally acknowledged, and that considering its place 
uh, not only adds to a more richly layered understanding of her iconography, but crucially illuminates the centrality of temporality, sequence, duration, and history in her art. I would like to pause for a moment and just say that when I first started working on DeFeo's photography, now almost 10 years ago, I think I could say that it had been underplayed, but I think what's been wonderful about hearing all the talks today is how many people are considering her photography in a serious way, which makes me very pleased. Um, I'd like to spend today's talk looking at the complex role that photography played in both the creation and the afterlife of a single painting, Cabbage Rose, which you see here. It might, and I'm sorry, you're gonna see a lot of the same photographs of DeFeo and the Rose, but it might be said that DeFeo's first extended encounter with photography occurred during the lengthy creation of her magnum opus, The Rose, which she began in 1958 and more or less stopped rather than completed in 1966. The painting was frequently photographed by friends and professional photographers over the course of its eight year evolution. And DeFeo's work on the painting could hardly be described as a progression if that term is understood to move from point A to point B with a forward momentum. Her technique, as has been discussed already today, was to build up and scrape back the paint, even at one point recentering the canvas within a larger support. DeFeo described the development of the rose as, quote, a metamorphosis, almost like art history, from very primitive to very classical to geometric, and then finally very Baroque. And then I pulled it back to really quite classical, end quote. And the title, as we know, changed too, from death rose to white rose, and finally to the rose. Taken together and or arranged chronologically, this body of photographs by others implies a linearity to DeFeo's process wholly out of step with her decisively unlinear actual working method. In its insistent narrativity, the body of photographs serves as both chronicle and counterpoint to the painting's making. Dana Miller has astutely suggested that DeFeo's later interest in photograph photographically documenting the stages of her process is the result of the hard-won lesson of creating the rose and her failure to fully document many of its intermediate stages that are now lost beneath nearly 2,000 pounds of paint. I think that this is undoubtedly true, but not the only, and maybe not even the most potent lesson that DeFeo gleaned about photography from the rose. After the rose was dramatically removed from DeFeo's apartment in 1965, it languished at the Pasadena Art Museum for nearly four years until 1969 when it was shown in Pasadena and in San Francisco. The challenge of storing the monumental work was resolved by transferring it to a conference room at the San Francisco Art Institute, where it would remain for 26 years, first covered by a protective coating and then fully immured. For a painting whose most distinctive feature is its overwhelming physical presence and insistent presentness one could only describe as aura, during the period from 1966 to DeFeo's death in 1989, the painting is conspicuous in its absence, represented only by reproductions. And for many years, the pictures were all that visibly remained of this monumental labor and came to substitute for the work itself. And though they capture the painting in its different moods, different stages and semi-darkness and raking light within the context of the artist's studio, they are both a partial portrait of a work and a poor simulacrum for the painting's physicality. As we have seen um, in multiple slides so far, uh, almost inevitably DeFeo herself was included within the photographs and much like Hans Namath's photographs of Jackson Pollock in action changed both the understanding of Pollock's work and of Pollock himself. The photographs, the widely published photographs of DeFeo in front of the rose and other of her paintings seem to physically equate the artist with the work, tying her bodily to the artwork and to the larger than life mythology that almost consumed it. As a result of these photographs, the rose has in effect come to stand metonymically for the artist itself, herself. But I am less interested in the way these photographs serve as a document of the rose than I am in the way they open up and elaborate on a kind of conceptual and temporal distance, pointing to the gap between origin and conclusion, between original and copy, between lived experience and history. 
These are ideas that were already knocking about in DeFeo's work. And I'm thinking here about her deep interest in classical art, for example, or even in her gorgeous 1956 painting entitled Origin that's at the Berkeley Museum of Art. But the photographs of the rose rendered these ideas quite literal and introduce a new one, that the gap between the moment of creation and the moment of reception and the knowledge that the art not only outlives the artist, but comes to replace her. If these ideas were suggested to DeFeo by the photographs taken by others of the Rose, in the early 1970s, she began to photograph photography into her own practice with both enthusiasm and intention. After nearly a four year creative hiatus that followed the completion of the Rose, DeFeo began to work again, both in acrylic paint and the new medium, photography. She was known, as been said before, at the San Francisco Art Institute to be one of the few non-photography teachers that allowed photography students to take her classes. And in turn, her students taught her how to use the school's darkroom. In 1973, an NEA Visual Artist Fellowship allowed her to purchase a medium format Hasselblad camera, which she called her, quote, most precious possession, and allowed her to replace her borrowed camera, which I believe is one of the ones you see here in the mirror. I love this self-portrait of her. Um, her engagement with the new medium was nearly all consuming. Her diaries from 1973 to 1975 show her shooting, processing film and printing essentially daily. In a 1988 interview, she described this activity. She said, quote, I quit painting for three years. I did nothing but photography. But this is not actually true. It does speak to the level of her engagement, an activity that was pointedly ignored by contemporary art historians. The most straightforward way that she used photography was as source material for her paintings. Since the invention of the medium in the mid 19th century, painters have used photographs in lieu of hand-drawn sketches. All evidence to the contrary, DeFeo claimed to have little natural talent for drawing, um, and we, we've seen multiple occasions that this is not true, but she supplemented her drawing by hand with significant bodies of photo studies that became the subject of future paintings. In 1974, when the monumental rose was covered by a protective coating, she began work on a new painting, Cabbage Rose, which is based on a photograph that you see here. DeFeo once claimed that the painting was inspired by a photograph she took of a cabbage in her aunt's garden, but, and there are photographs of cabbage in her large collection of botanical photo photography, but the photograph on which this painting is clearly based is neither a cabbage nor a rose. She printed the photograph on high contrast paper, which renders the highlights brighter and the darks darker. Consequently, the dark areas of the photographs, particularly its center, devolve into voids, performing more an act of abstraction than one of transcription. The photograph and the resulting painting emphasize the radiating lines from the center, a formal structure which DeFeo explored frequently, not least of which in the rose and the central void or portal, which she regularly employed in her paintings of the 70s and 80s. DeFeo mounted the photograph, as you can see here with tape, um, making future archivists very nervous, uh, to paper wrap mat board and she hung it on the wall of the studio immediately to the right of the canvas. And though we don't have time to dwell on it here, I do feel it's important to point out the number of photographs DeFeo made that were not studies for paintings utterly dwarfs the number of photographs that became source materials. And to my mind, this really speaks to an engagement with photography on its own terms and not one that was only instrumentalized in service of her work as a painter. She photographed the plants and the leaves that she saw in her hikes on Mount Tamil Pius in Marin County, as well as in the greenhouses of the Conservatory of Flowers in Golden Gate Park, San Francisco, and floral motifs, particularly roses, abound. Here you can see her playing with one of photography's key formal concept, the crop, framing a sliver of a photograph and transforming it into a radically horizontal frieze of tangled vines. And though, of course, a cabbage rose, and I don't need to explain this to an English audience, is a type of rose, um, the species of plant that DeFeo has chosen to predict, to, to depict seems incidental. Um, but given her interest in wordplay 
And her formal interest in the cauliflower, which she photographed regularly, I can't help but think that the cauliflower, whose name in French and Italian comes from the word cabbage flower, might have influenced the naming of the painting Cabbage Rose. Of all the paintings DeFeo made based on photographs, Cabbage Rose perhaps bears the most recognizable visual relationships to its source image. Yet a series of 29 photographs that DeFeo made to track her own progress demonstrate that her work on this painting and her relationship to photography exceeded, far exceeded a simple literal translation of one medium to another. The painting does connect, makes connections not only to its immediate source material, but also across DeFeo's own history, looping back again to the rose. She described Cabbage Rose in 1975 Quote, I think of it as another visual variation on the white rose painting. Visually, the idea is different. It is also a different medium. It's an irony that I didn't plan on, but it amuses me to relate it to the past. The medium of this painting directed it to another visual appearance. As you heard in Catherine's earlier talk, beginning in the 1970s, DeFeo began compiling what she called visual diaries, photographic records of her work in progress, neatly labeled with typescript numbers, as you can see here in the lower right-hand corner, sometimes even with textual references to guide the viewer toward clearer comprehension. I think it is worth asking who DeFeo's intended audience was for these diaries, as the information included in them was directed toward a future audience rather than the inwardly directed musings of her written diary, which in their linguistic shorthand and frequent incomprehensibility are clearly intended for an audience of one, herself. DeFeo not only used these photographs to trace her own progress, but to present her work to history, a transmission from the origin across its reception, uh, toward its own reception across time. And here you can see her set up um, with the two small studies for Cabbage Rose, as well as what looks like a study for one of her loop system paintings. And Leah will have to correct me, but I believe that that is a study for, it's not actually an extant painting, as well as a small image of a bird, possibly one of Judith's Xerox copies. Um, this was a typical setup for DeFeo who surrounded herself with a variety of imagery and objects as she painted, often with no formal connection to the work being executed, as well as other examples of her own work juxtaposed with paintings under progress, an arrangement she felt gave her a kind of clarity as to what the new work needed. A second view of the two small studies, this time one is reoriented from vertical to horizontal, and the bird has been replaced by the source photograph and the loop system removed. I'm interested in the way the two compositions appear to be symmetrically flipped along the central axis, almost as if painted by, from a photograph that had been printed in reverse, though I'm not so aware that any such version of the photograph exists. Here, the two small canvases have been dispatched and replaced by a large panel that looks to be in the very early stages of development. And you can see affixed at the right that she rigged up this really ingenious little box in the corner on which she was able to mount the source photograph for reference as she painted. And in number four, you see a much more complete version of the painting much closer to completion. If we follow the order of the typescript numbers, one, two, three, and four, DeFeo gives an impression of a logical progression from small study to large sketch to a painting in the process of completion. Yet DeFeo's narration of the painting's evolution in her daily journal, which runs alongside this visual diary, presents an entirely different chronology, one far less straightforward and more circuitous with multiple points of entry, as well as reversals and doublings back. She describes a process not of creation from zero, but of coaxing an extant image out of the support itself, an image she finds evasive and difficult to pin down. She writes, Monday, December 2nd, last night I really barreled into the four by six panel with Bob's enamel, a wonderful sensuous feeling, the scale and the change of media appeal. I don't really feel like I'm painting unless I can smell terp. Luckily, I didn't miss smoking, which goes hand in hand with terp. That panel, however, is weird. I swear a hidden spirit resides in each and every support that in good part determines their destiny. This one, supposedly to be the cabbage rose, 
keep sidestepping the image directly. Though photographs one and two show the two small studies as predecessors to the large panel introduced in photograph three, on December 7th, five days after tackling the big panel she describes, she, she also describes working on two little cabbage roses simultaneously as, in, as if introducing them into the process for the first time to work out the challenges she is facing with the larger one. On December 9th, she returns to the large panel, once again defining this moment as the beginning of the process, writing, Sunday night I started a large version of Cabbage. I'm reminded of Pollock's title, The Deep, in terms of my feelings for it. Sure wish I had the space and materials for a series of things. The forms also call to mind a little painting I abandoned this summer. One of the telephone collages still intrigues me. DeFeo's written diary, her visual diary, and her actual working process in fact chart three separate chronologies and modes of time, intersecting and inflecting one another, but operating more like a fugue or a jazz riff than any kind of linear march from start to finish. If the photographs appear to impose a kind of logical order to the process, corralling the chaos of DeFeo's multiple be beginnings and false starts for earlier for easier comprehension by future historians, they do not in fact reflect, but rather distort the actual making of the work and in many ways obscure completely the complexity of her process. If, if images one through five attempt to impose a kind of linear progress from small studies to large panel, to large panel painting, this one does something completely different, plunging into the painting itself to focus on the detail of a smaller segment. I am I'm reminded of Antonioni's 1966 film, uh, cult film, Blow Up, in which the photographer, upon closer scrutiny of his negatives, discovers that he may have been witness to and documented a murder by accident. What did DeFeo hope to find in the minutia of her own painting, a work she should ha would have known as intimately as the back of her own hand? As you have heard earlier, DeFeo took up acrylic paint in the wake of the rose, believing that her severe gum disease was in part due to the oil paint she had previously used. And this meant that she could no longer use a physical thickness, a kind of impasto, um, to create depth, but had to resort to the optical illusions of Renaissance perspective, using light and dark colors to create highlights and shadows. And she struggled mightily with this medium. Um, and she talks about it in her journals at length, um, trying a variety of homemade recipes to give the acrylic paint what she called body. And she, she alludes that one day uh, conservators will be very angry with her, but she uses eggshells, bisquick and cornstarch, and by February 8th starts to feel that she, the painting is shaping up. She writes, at least I've reached a kind of level of surface substance, which I seem to demand in a painting, and a few areas become, begin to come alive. These close-ups of the painting's surface thus document her workings and reworkings of the paint. But the photographic close-up also mimics the way DeFeo physically moved in her studio as she worked in at least one case, tackling multiple canvases at opposite ends of the studio, moving closer and farther from her painting, and sometimes even using a diminishing glass to look at them from a distance to avoid being sucked into the details at the expense of the overall composition. In describing her approach to loop system, she emphasized the need to see the work from a distance to grasp, quote, the strength of the real basic spatial statement so I don't allow all the sensuousness of the paint to seduce me into thinking I've got something structurally strong when I don't. Here, the camera serves not as a tool of documentation, but of analysis, transforming the large panel into smaller, fragmentary standalone works, given their own formal logic by the parameters of the camera's frame. As you can see, she's moving back in and out and backward over the course of the sequence. Um, in December, DeFeo introduced yet another system for tracking the progress of her work. In addition to the typescript numbers that she affixed to the surface of the print, she also introduced the date into the photograph itself 
painting it on a board in the studio and is therefore captured in the negative, like the proof of life, <laughs> proof of life photographs that a kidnapper might send with the victim holding the newspaper to show they were alive on that day. Um, but because these dates are embedded in the photograph themselves, they can't be sequentially manipulated afterward. These dated photographs, which all appear toward the end of DeFeo's sequence of the 29, seem to offer a safeguard against the kind of retroactive restructuring that she enacted with the first photographs in the sequence. And yet again, the language of her diary runs counter to the forward progression of the sequential photographs. On January 5th, she writes, the painting is not growing well, or so I feel. Last night, I wailed into it again, can't get a secure feeling about the rightness of my procedures with the medium, have taken, as usual, many pictures of non-progress. Here you can see a detail of the date. I'm not reproducing the entire sequence of 29, but they sort of move in and out, as you've seen, in similar ways. Um, and the last ones all have this date uh, incorporated into the, the painting itself, into the photograph itself. In the last photograph in the sequence, the final image of the canvas, which is now lowered to rest across the top of two paint cans, the loop study is restored to the position it occupied in the first photograph, embracing a split temporality that simultaneously loops back to its origin and punctuates the end. In 1962, George Kubler, a specialist in pre-Columbian archaeology, wrote a volume entitled The Shape of Time, in which he proposed an alternate approach to art history that cast aside traditional analyses of biography and iconography and proposed that art history was a linked but nonlinear succession of formal relationships across time. Kubler's work was very little taken up by art historians at the time, but became something of a cult text among artists in the 1960s, no doubt due in part to Ad Reinhardt's evangelizing of Kubler's theories in prints. Reinhardt also bought multiple copies of the book and handed it out to every young artist he met. Robert Smithson, who was the recipient of one of Reinhardt's copies, and John Baldessari are among the many artists with whom Kubler's text resonated and who incorporated his theories into their work quite literally in Baldessari's case. Those artists who took up Kubler's text engaged fully with the wide range and complexity of Kubler's radical proposals, but it was his ideas about temporality that were most widely disseminated. There's no indication that DeFeo read Kubler's text or even that she was familiar with his ideas, but given her voracious reading habits and her curious mind, it wouldn't surprise me if she knew the work. In examining the sequence of photographs around the making of Cabbage Rose and many other paintings, I can't help thinking that his description of the evolution of art from primal objects that evolve and change across formal sequences might have triggered a glimmer of recognition about her very own approach, both over her long-standing obsession and return to particular forms, and even within the creation of individual paintings like Cabbage Rose. Kubler wrote of the historian, and I quote, Knowing the past is astonishing, is as astonishing a performance as knowing the stars. Astronomers look only at old light. There is no other light for them to look at. This old light of dead or distant stars was emitted long ago and it reaches us only in the present. Many historical events like astronomical bodies also occur long before they appear, such as secret treaties, ed memoir, or important works of art made for ruling personages. The physical substance of these documents often reaches qualified observers only centuries or millennia after the event. Hence, astronomers and historians have this in common. Both are concerned with appearances noted in the present but occurring in the past. The analogies between stars and works of art can profitably be pursued. However fragmentary its condition, any work of art is actually a portion of arrested happening or an emanation of past time. It is a graph of an activity now stilled, but a graph made visible like an astronomical body by a light that originated with the activity. Like the astronomer, the historian is engaged upon the portrayal of time." End quote. So I've been thinking about DeFeo's photography for a while, and as you can hear, I'm still finding enormous richness there. 
As we have seen from her use of photography in the creation of a single work, it is crucial to resist any simple understanding of it as either source material or chronological documentation. Rather than use photography as a mere documentary tool, like Kubler's astronomer DeFeo profitably used the medium to crack open relationships between presentness and pastness, to speak across time, and to radically interrogate ideas of originality. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. That was a rich and very comprehensive presentation. And I think, you know, as someone who's spent a little bit of time looking at her, what I, until your um, lecture, thought of as primarily documentary photographs, I understand much better they really were an analysis tool, as you call them. Um, and I, I, while you, you were speaking, I was thinking of um, this old technique of painters to test their paintings by stepping away, turning it upside down and seeing if the composition still holds. And I think the um, photographs, at least if I understood correctly what you were saying, and that, you know, it was a lot more complex, but the, the, the distancing um, effect that the camera can have um, and that it had for DeFeo was a very effective tool. But I think I was even more struck by what you just, what you were describing as the, the narrative of the photographs running in some sense um, sort of counter to what she was describing in the diary. So I have to then go back and reread and relook. So thank you very much. That was really thought provoking. Um, wow, there's a lot of um, stuff to think about and I invite our um, audience to, to send their questions. Um, we had an early question from Vanessa Woods and she asked if, and I think that is a really good question I would like to put it to Judith um, if um, Judith, do you know if um, Jade Feo ever used uh, Xerox transfer within her paintings as image bases to paint on top of well um, I don't think she used I mean um, she didn't transfer Xerox into painting but she used Xerox as a ready-made drawing for example, so, so she took uh, uh, a Xerox and painted on top of it, or sometimes included a piece of Xerox into a painting. So it, she, she was, yeah, I presented the, the Xerox themselves as a composition in themselves, but it, she, she used it in different, many different ways, and including in her paintings as a ready-made motif. Mm -hmm. uh, she was interested in motif, she just cut it and glued it uh, in her painting and painted over it. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, it's 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 a material. I mean, she just as I said, she didn't make any distinction between the, the different uh, materials she had uh, uh, at hand. So she, if if the shape interested her, and it's it's here. So yes, yeah. is it? There's no. I think as I think she said, there was no hierarchy in her. Own. Hierarchy. It it was. She 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 wasn't thinking in terms of noble medium. Hmm. I mean, she was really thinking about the engendering of the shape, and she was constantly experimenting with materials mm -hmm. uh, without any hierarchy. Did um, did she only ever use one? And I'm sorry if you said it and I miss it, but did she ever only use one um, Xerox machine, or were there different models? I think she she used different ones. Yes, but um, I've, I've, uh, yeah, she used different one. I mean, she used the one that was at Mills College, and mm -hmm. also uh, she went to copy shops too. Uh, so she didn't had one at home. I mean, some artists did, but she didn't. But uh, she used the <laughs> Uh, the one that um, that was at um, that were at Mills College, and yeah. uh, basically, and also in coffee shops. Yes, oh, they were really expensive one there. Like yes. in some place, I can't remember where, of course, but I feel like I remember her saying that she was trying like to compare the different properties of the different. Yes, yeah, because they were very specific. I mean, the machines. I mean, a certain artists used a specific brand and not another one. I mean. It was uh, it's it's a um, whole uh, technology. I mean, they were they were very uh, distinct. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, all right. There are many questions coming in. So um, Francesca Wilmot says, "Thank you so much for fascinating papers. A number of panelists touched on DeFeo's self-referentiality in relation to the San Francisco art scene and in her responses to the California landscape." I was wondering to what extent DeFeo traveled and if anything more could be said about 
how she positioned herself in relation to other art scenes in America, for instance, Los Angeles and New York, Europe and beyond. I wonder, Suzanne, Suzanne would you feel comfortable responding to that? Sure, um, I can start. I can say a couple of things about it. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there, there definitely are elements of, of her um, or moments in her life where travel was quite central. And so one that's often talked about um, in the historiography is a trip right after her graduation from Berkeley, um, which has a kind of interesting anecdote about it as well on this kind of gender line um, that Jay was kind of non-specific in that regard. And so maybe she wouldn't have actually been awarded the opportunity for travel had they realized she was a young woman, um, mm -hmm. but it allowed her to travel throughout Europe. And she made a series of works in Florence that became really important to her later as well. Um, you'll forgive me, I forget the exact year, but I know she returned to Europe in the 1980s again, as well as Africa. Um, so there's another series called Impressions of Africa, um, but she also sometimes, uh, some of the tissue boxes were also related to some of that content. So I think it goes to this broader point about how place is both experienced but also recollected and the way that so many materials for her were you know sources for direct contact but also became mnemonic or became procedural and I would kind of put travel in that category. Um, the other thing I might say is that um, you know I think and I was trying to just kind of point to this dimension of her work something that I've been you know trying to think about is how and Corey you're, you're um, your Kubler reference is really helpful for me in this regard too, but kind of imagining so many cultural and geographical touchstones that was something that she did. And she was a capacious reader and also a capacious looker and a voracious you know, looker and reader. And that she had a real sense, I think, of art as coming from many cultures and many times. And that I think is something that for me is really important as a kind of counterbalance to any kind of localism of geography and how to kind of balance that aspirational intention to participate in a kind of capital H history of art that was transcultural, that was, you know, moving across broad swaths of geography and time and that she intended and wanted to ultimately be seen in relation to, but also um, and maybe this is in a different way from how Catherine was kind of thinking about this COVID moment, you know, thinking so much about the, you know, loss of travel and the kind of particularity of place and how place and local communities are resonating so differently now, like an idea of critical regionalism, maybe. Um, but thinking about, you know, these kind of two poles of her experience on the one hand, so vast, um, and then on the other, so, so close. Um, so anyway, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that if other people would like to. Uh, Suzanne, I think it was so interesting. You know, the, the Kubler thing for me, I didn't, I'm sure this happens to other people. It came to me rather late and also while I was sleeping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when all my weird ideas come, but it, since it came to be kind of late, I didn't feel like I wanted at that point to go back and rewrite the whole thing and start over, but that'll be another time. But Judith, I loved how you brought Faucillon in because of course then Kubler is pitching those ideas outward. Um, and then thinking about that idea of travel um, as well, you know, even when DeFeo was in California, I mean, she traveled across time and across cultures through books in, in ways that are very interesting. I mean, she had this book about the Japanese samurai and, you know, the, the shape of the helmets and became, you know, and she, as far as I know, never went to Japan, but, you know, sort of immersed herself both in time and in culture uh, as a kind of armchair traveler that I think is, um, and then the, those images became these important kinds of source materials as well. It's an interesting dimension. I mean, I think her being in California in between those two really critical periods of travel that bookend her career was both a detriment to her um, reception in New York, but also perhaps incredibly generative because she was isolated from that kind of, that world and um, in a kind of self-generative place that was very productive. Yeah, even if she had a relationship with Dorothy Miller and she was like included in the 16 Americans show, uh, very early on, but uh, yes, 
but didn't go the opening because you didn't think it was yeah. that big a deal, right? You know, <laughs> well, yeah. it's a big story. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated that story, isn't it? Very complicated. All of our um, panelists to, to maybe join us in image and sound. Um, and um, Leah, I was wondering, I know you will be speaking and sort of um, in a minute anyway, but there's one question that I think you would be the best person to answer, and that is if her unpublished diaries will ever be printed in part or whole. That is a question from, from our audience. I think eventually, yes. Um, we are transcribing them. They need edits. They need more work, but um, at least um, a selection, and we're working on it very hard. <laughs> edited version of them yeah um all right then uh, corrected in the in the in the chat by uh marianne milford who points out that defeo did travel to japan with her <laughs> and i forgot yes. that thanks marianne yeah and one of the um comments that maybe to add to the question to the early question about her role as a mentor and professor is that i think she did travel in later years, but Leah, please correct me if I'm wrong, with some of her former students. Um, so to, she sort of became a mentor and then a friend, as it happens to some. Um, uh, there's another question from Paris Kotz, who's saying, how did the role of the art institution, schools, museum, curators, etc., over time affect her art making, both locally and afar? Does anybody feel... Um, called to answer that question. I wonder if, if Paris means, you know, how did the, um, the opportunity to show, for example, um, affect her art making? Um, because I think some, some artists feel very um, encouraged to make more work if they know they have an exhibition coming up, but other artists also feel quite um, intimidated and then sort of discouraged after a mid-career show, for example, you know, I think it's the, the art institutions play sometimes an ambivalent, ambivalent role in, in some artist's career. Actually, Leah, would you mind uh, saying something to that effect because you've got such a historic view of, of, of her institutional um, history? Like all things to fail, I don't think there's one answer. But um, looking, she definitely went to exhibitions. She went often. So museums as a place to show art were very important and influential to her. We also know that she actively at times wanted and talked to people about having exhibitions. Um, there weren't a lot of people coming to her. So there were times when she worked herself up to going to talk to galleries and occasionally curators. So the notion perhaps early on that she eschewed any kind of public space wasn't the experience of the 80s, certainly, um, when she was very much ready to have her work shown and exhibited. We also know that exhibitions were inspirational and sometimes torturous. There's an exhibition she did in 1983 of large colored oil paintings in her new studio. And there are many, many journal entries um, and letters written about her trauma with that deadline. She, in the end, produced extraordinary work. But um, there, there was a deadline that both worked for her in terms of um, getting the new work done and was extraordinarily difficult for her. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leah. Another question is about how... Can I just build just for one second about what Leah just said? One of the things that Leah showed me that I have loved is the way in the 80s, DeFeo also um, herself was engaging with curatorial perspectives on her work. Mm -hmm. um, and was it Albright, Leah? I can't remember to whom she wrote that like eight page manifesto about how she wanted him to look at her work. And then it's, that was for me very interesting because she talks about photography and she underlines like I would like to speak to you about this you know I can't remember who that was she, she was did out. it more than one time she did yeah. it with Henry Hopkins she did it with um, Albright and she at very late in her life you may be thinking of this did it with Walter Hopps maybe that was it but I can just remember this like multi-page document in which she outlines her whole entire I mean she writes her own chronology and 
attributes the significance of her own works. You know, yeah. she does the, the art historian's job for them in a, in a way that's um, really quite lovely. <laughs> and helpful, yeah. <laughs> um, there is a question uh, about her political positions. So Susan Platt says, I note that Judith has written on Dada. Jay was forged in opposition to mainstream society and its obsession with war, as was the rest of her group. Um, so there's lots of other... Yes, it's a very interesting question and very complex, actually. I think that she wasn't, I mean, she, she wasn't really participating in demonstration or thinking about her art as a, a message for, um, to defend any cause. But it seemed to me that in her work, uh, politics lies elsewhere. I mean, outside an openly contesting position. Um, for example, uh, by taking um, this state-of-the-art technology, such as the photocopture, and uh, to divert it from its utilitarian function to affirm the subjectivity of the artist is in itself um, um, a political stance. Um, so it's more subtle than just, than just uh, participating in openly, you know, um, politics. Um, um, question. I think that it's in in her heart. You are to find the political in the way she used things. Um, so um, for me, I mean, to take just the example of the Xeroxes. I mean, it's it's um, it's a, a form of power grab. Well, following on from there, she, there's another question about. Um, what you've presented. So um, I'm curious if Defey was aware of or connected in any way to other artists working with Xerox or photography machines, such as Sonia Sheridan. And then um, so Lewis is saying that yeah. he usually that they had also. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I have no proof, but so <laughs> when I look through the journal, she, at, at one point she mentioned Sonia, but Leah. <laughs> told me that she'd been doing some research and he wasn't talking about Sonia Sheridan. So I don't think that she were aware of other artists doing Xerox. I mean, it was um, a practice during those years where artists were uh, working in a very isolated way. I mean, they, they were experimenting. And so I don't think that she was aware of all that scene. Even if, I mean, Sheridan was quite well known, and but uh, she was in Chicago, and well, I don't think that she was aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jude. Um, th there are many more questions, not only in my head, but also coming from the audience, but sadly we've run um, out of time. And so what I would very much like to do now is invite Leah to, um, you know, to sort of help us come to a, a, an end to a beautiful um, symposium. So thank you very much from, from uh, Joe and myself for wonderful presentations that were super inspiring and, and covered a lot of ground, I think. Um, thank you also for, our, um, for the patience and the interest and the engagement of our audience. So Leah, if you'd like to say a few words, we'll be really grateful. Thank you. I jotted things down. Um, I want to start by very warmly and gratefully thanking Pia and Joe and the Courtholds Research Forum for the idea to do this symposium, which we first discussed more than two years ago, and for the persistence and vision that has realized this day. Um, the J. DeFeo Foundation trustees, Janie Green and Diane Frankel, Join me in special thanks to our current archivists, Don Troy and Carly Sitko, who have supported this symposium with numerous dedicated hours, providing information to the presenters. Dawn and Carly are the pillars of the J. DeFeo Foundation, as our researchers know. These last hours have been an artist's foundation dream. <laughs> Each presenter digging deeply into J. DeFeo's art, her words, and previous scholarship to open new explorations, refreshed, intriguing, and evocative. Echoing J. DeFeo's approach with the abstract and the literal, the expressive, the intended, and the accidental, I hear pre presenters embrace in responding to the contradictions and fearlessness in her work. <laughs> 
I also hear open-endedness of ideas and comments, mirroring the artist's willingness to change, to learn, and to incorporate new with the established in her studio. To have the art and the archive come alive in these rich and beautiful examinations is the epitome of the purpose of our work, and we offer our sincere appreciation. Our fondest hope is that you will all continue with your explorations. Based on what you have learned about Jay DeFeo, um, everyone, the audience and the panelists, um, I suspect you can all imagine with me how pleased Jay would have been with these inspired ideas and careful examinations. I want to say a word about the work of the foundation, which is the result of Jay DeFeo's perhaps unlikely envisioning of a long-term legacy for her art and archive at a time in her life that almost defied possibility. With both her self-deprecating humor and her dead seriousness about her art, she created the space for history to know her work. The J. DeFeo Foundation accepted and shared her vision, and we now work within our charitable mission to collaborate on exhibitions, publications, support research, and grant making. As other examples of ways and places to discover more about DeFeo's work, I'll mention two books um, that are in the works, one from Yale University and another from Sobers Cove Press. We are working on an exhibition for this fall in New York that will explore the dialogue between Jay DeFeo and Bruce Connor through their friendship and their work. And last, but you all know not least, I wanna say that The Rose is currently on view at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York and will be at least throughout this year. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Leah, and thank you to all our amazing uh, panelists. Thanks, Pia, for steering us through that second part now. Um, so that slightly awkward moment in a Zoom conference when you just go, thank you so much, everybody, and goodbye. And um, we are so grateful for you for sticking with us throughout this and have a wonderful uh, weekend wherever you are. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you.